That's so quiet. Change that. That's right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City Council meeting. Uh, thank you for your patience. We did have a, an overly extended uh, closed session, so um, thank you. So if you'd please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the Statement of Values. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As we gather, we humbly, we humbly seek blessings upon this meeting. May we act with strength, courage, and will to perform our obligations and duties to our people with justice to all. Let us seek wisdom so that we may act in the best interests of our people, our neighbors, and our country. All this we ask so we may serve our community with fairness and respect, putting their needs before all. Thank you. Please be seated. <coughs> Uh, City Clerk, roll call. Yeah, Council Member Caserta? Here. Davis? Here. Colstad? Here. Mahan? Here. O'Neill? Here. Watanabe? Here. And Mary Gilmore? Here. If I Thank may you. also read the AB 23 announcement yes. that members of the Santa Clara Stadium Authority, Sports and Open Space Authority, and Housing Authority are entitled to receive $30 for each attended meeting. Bless you. Bless you. Uh, and the statement behavioral standards. The City of Santa Clara has adopted a code of ethics and values and behavioral standards for public meetings to promote and maintain the highest levels of conduct. This includes mutual respect, robust discussion, and allowing city business to be done in an efficient and consistent manner. Please note that as the presiding officer, the mayor's direction in matters of process and decorum should be followed. Welcome and thank you for your participation. Uh, thank you, uh, City Clerk. Uh, first, we have approval of minutes, September 19, 2017. Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. Lights on the motion. And that passes unanimously. Second is September 26, 2017. Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. No discussion. Lights on the motion. That also passes unanimously. Uh, continuances and exceptions. I think, City Manager, we had an item. I have um, three items that I'd like to call out for the council's attention. Item 13A, we'd like to pull that and hear that, have that item heard separately. Um, there are some clarifications to the map that we need to, to call out. Item 13A6, we'd like to request that, that item be dropped and we'll bring it back if appropriate at a later date. And then item 13B5, we'd like to continue that to November 7th. There were some clerical errors in there that we'd like to bring back um, accurate information. So moved. Can we do all those at once, City Attorney? Okay. Uh, motion for that and a second. Is there um, any discussion or any member of the public want to discuss any of those items? Okay, seeing none, lights on the motion. And that passes unanimously. Um, I'm going to ask the Council's indulgence. We are waiting for uh, our first special order of business, was, which is a presentation welcoming uh, the delegation uh, from our sister city of Limerick, Ireland, and they were delayed in their flight. They should be arriving eight approximately 8 o'clock, and since they are coming uh, directly from San Francisco Airport and right off a long, long, long flight from Ireland to uh, London to San Francisco, we're going to, wherever we are, I'd like to take a break and then do the presentation for the, the group from Ireland. So it won't take long, but they, I don't want to have them come and uh, wait a few hours while we talk about things uh, with their jet lag. So, um, so hope you'll indulge me there. And secondly, I see some, are those Mickey Mouse ears in the back there? Uh, I would like to, after our special order of businesses, that we pull up one of the items from the consent calendar. I just have to find it here in a second. Uh, the City of Santa Clara's Parks and Recreation Performance Dance Team. So if we could pull item E1 forward to right after our special order of businesses. So there's a motion and a second. We can pull that item and, and pull it forward. Lights on the motion. Thank you. That passes unanimously. All right, so we're going to uh, delay the 12A, our Ireland visitors. 
And our next uh, special order of business, we have a presentation of a donation and approval to appropriate $5,000 from the Air Products Foundation to purchase supplies and materials for the Fire Department Community Emergency Response uh, Team Program. Uh, Chief Kelly, are you making this presentation? Please come forward. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Gilmore, members of the Council. Tonight's agenda item is a request to accept the donation from the Air Products Foundation in the amount of $5,000 and appropriate the funds to purchase supplies for the Fire Department's Community Emergency Response Team, or CERT, program. Through our local CERT program, citizens are trained to be self-sufficient after a major disaster, such as an earthquake, when local resources would be stretched really thin. To date, firefighters have trained over 1,500 community volunteers in basic disaster response skills, such as fire safety, light search and rescue, neighborhood team organization, how to secure gas and electric utilities, and in disaster medical operations, including basic first aid. In the aftermath of a major emergency, our, our CERT volunteers can serve as first responders until professional emergency rescue forces arrive. CERT is a nationally uh, rec recognized program supported by the Federal Emergency Management Asso uh, Agency, FEMA. We've seen some major disasters around the country this summer with um, hurricanes Harvey in Houston and Irma in Florida. In those emergencies, CERT volunteers played a significant role in helping those most in need in their communities. And we believe our well-trained civilian response team members here in Santa Clara would be equally helpful should the need arise here. The donation from Air Products Foundation would be used to purchase 159 kits that would include personal protective equipment for CERT program graduates, things like goggles and helmets and gloves and those kinds of things. And the program is managed by our emergency services coordinator, Lisa Schoenthal, and other fire department personnel. Here to provide a brief description of the Air Products Grant Donation Program is Representative Michael Chow and also Samuel McHenry. Mr. Chow. Good Hi. evening, Mr. Chow. Hello. Welcome. Oh, well, well, yeah, my name is Michael Chow. It's a pleasure uh, on behalf of the Air Product Foundation to present a grant in the amount of $5,000 uh, to the Santa Clara Fire Department for funding of the, uh, the Community Emergency um, Response uh, uh, Team programs. Right? Air Product is one of the leading industrial gas company that has operations in over 50 countries, and that includes the facility here out in uh, Santa Clara. One of our core values is safety. Our chairman has set an annual goal of zero accidents and zero incidents for each of the facility we operate. We believe a safe workplace is the moral responsibility, responsibility of a company. In addition, we believe we need to be good corporate citizens, and it comes in a couple of different forms. From the safe operation of our facility, to volunteering in the local organization and community, to providing funding assistance for the betterment of the community in, in the areas we operate. This grant will be used for the purchase of, of over 150 backpacks for residents who have completed the uh, city's uh, disaster preparedness course. These residents will, be, will have been trained by the CERT program to help support and secure neighborhoods in the event of a disaster until official help can arrive. These residents, uh, the, the CERT program and the specific effort fits nicely with Air Products Safety First culture and also with Air Products goal of supporting the community in where, in where we operate. So we wish the fire department much, much success with the continue, continuation of CERT. We commend the residents who volunteer to be trained by the Santa Clara Fire Department and are willing to assist the neighbors in a potential time of need and we are really, we are pleased to be able to support this uh, program. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments and for your very, very generous donation from your company to our fire department and, and ultimately the citizens of Santa Clara. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a photographer here? We do have a photographer. And they brought hey. a really big check, too. So I know. Right, that's why we want to get it as soon as possible, get our hands on it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So okay. should, should you find we a bank to cash those in? Perhaps some down here. We'll come to the front here. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. 
We're just going to stand up. We're going to have you come up here. We're just going to stand. You want to stand? Or let's go down. Looks better. They can see us now. Okay. Yeah, I, I did not see you. One more. One more person. <laughs> Okay, one, two, three. One more. Okay, one, two, three. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have the Cultural Commission presentation of upcoming events for November and December 2017. And Loretta, take it away. Yes, so good evening to the council members and to the audience members here and the audience members at home. <laughs> <laughs> I am here as I uh, do about once a month and talk to you about the events coming up for uh, the Cultural Commission. So again, um, you can see there, you can get more information on our Facebook page for various activities. We do concerts in the park, the Friday Night Live events, um, monthly commemorative series, uh, have art in public places, community mixers, and so much more. Uh, we definitely uh, want people to come volunteer, give us your ideas. Um, and you can find that on the city's website. Um, there's a list of the current cultural commissioners. Last month, I told you that there's an opening on the cultural commission. And um, I asked you to think about it and to tell your neighbors. And now I'm telling you, you need to submit and apply. Um, uh, <laughs> applications are due by November 14th at 5 p.m. Uh, so come join our, our merry band and, and uh, help us plan to do a lot of stuff. Um, this next month, November, is Seek Awareness and Appreciation Month. Uh, there will be a whole series of events put on by the organization Joy of Siwa, including um, diversity film series, uh, food packing for the hungry, um, a reception over at the San Jose Gudwara, which if you've never been there, oh, the architecture, um, a play and a uh, other cultural events. Um, coming up next Friday is our Friday Night Live event where we will have Grupo Folklorico Los Lorales, um, a lovely group of, of Folklorico dancers that uh, we have had in the past. Um, we uh, had to postpone our sculptural competition start, but we intend to announce it early December uh, with the theme and everything. Um, so thank you very much for your intention, and I hope to see you at the events. Thank you. Right. And thank you for all your hard work on the commission. You make our city really fun. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a promotion of a vacancy on the planning commission. And Yuki, please come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor and council members. Thank you for an opportunity to promote a vacancy we have on the Planning Commission. My name is Yuki Ikeizi, and I'm the chair of the commission. We want Santa Clara residents to apply for a vacancy and volunteer and help shape the future of our community. Um, can you scroll to the next page? Okay. Planning Commission comprises seven members appointed by the City Council for, for four-year terms. The commissioner has to be eligible to vote and also be a resident of Santa Clara. 
We advise the city council on long range planning and development of our city. A lot of information on planning is available on our general plan on the city website. I encourage applicants to download a copy and take a look. Okay, the Planning Commission conducts public hearings on development proposals and land use proposals. We represent the community at large and provide a check and balance on each project. We protect the interests of our community while respecting the rights of property owners. In recent years, we have been busy reviewing plans on apartment complexes, shopping malls, office campuses, single residences, doggy daycare, breweries, and new restaurants. It's a lot of fun to find out about the new stuff coming along in the city. We are also acutely aware that Santa Clara is transforming rapidly. There's a rush of developments for accommodating the new people and businesses attracted to Silicon Valley. The Planning Commission constantly uh, weighs the pros and cons of each proposed development against the interests of its neighbors. You have more, just a bigger audience, Yuki. Yeah, That's thank all. you. <laughs> thank the you. They came here. from a, across the pond. <laughs> yes. Just to see me. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so we also review proposals on new ordinances and zoning changes and make recommendations on environmental issues. Some of us also serve on the architectural committee that reviews remodeling, um, home remodeling and other projects. Next slide. Okay, uh, so the Planning Commission meet two Wednesday evenings per month and for study sessions. Uh, commissioners and especially the new members are encouraged to attend state and national conferences to get trained on land use issues. I have attended these conferences and learned a great deal. I also enjoy meeting planning commissioners from other cities there. They too are committed to improving their communities and they make me appreciate the incredibly strong fabric of our great state and great nation. Okay, so how to apply. Applicants can pick up an application form at City Hall or apply online. Um, I checked and um, you, can, you can actually fill out the form online. Application deadline is October 31st and City Council will interview the applicants and pick our new members on November 7th. Um, and in closing, I would like to express my hopes to attract a diverse pool of applicants for this vacancy. I especially hope that many women will be interested in applying because currently I am the only female member of the Commission of Seven. You need these kind of odds up here, yeah. right? Yeah, Th that sounds good to me. Okay, and as representatives of the Santa Clara residents, we are entrusted with decisions that directly affect their homes, businesses, and neighborhoods. Having a broad representation that reflects our diverse community will help us continue to earn that trust. Mayor and council members, thank you again for allowing me to present this amazing opportunity to volunteer and serve. I really look forward to welcoming a new member of our commission. Thank you very much, Yuki, for, and uh, thank you. So there's an opportunities of both the Cultural Commission and the Planning Commission for our residents, so please take advantage of it. So as you can see, we have our chambers have just swelled a little bit. We have some uh, special guests this evening, straight off the plane from, uh, from Ireland, just to see us here this evening in Santa Clara. So just to let you know, I know you might be a little bit tired and maybe have a little bit of jet lag, but we have a huge television viewing audience, so smile. <laughs> Anyways, um, so our special order of business this evening is a presentation welcoming this delegation and exchange students visiting from our Santa Clara sister city in Limerick, Ireland. And if you could see, we have your flag right up on the wall over there. And we have the Irish flag over here. And we're all wearing these, uh, the US and pins in your honor. So welcome, welcome, welcome to Santa Clara. Um, for tonight's special order of business, we have some very, uh, the special guests joining us here. And so please join me in welcoming this delegation and exchange students visiting, and we're really excited to have you here, so. <laughs> so
So I'm going to start by introducing Yvonne Daly, who's here on behalf of Limerick City and County Councils. If you'd like to come up and make some remarks. And welcome. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, guys, and sorry for being late. Our flight was delayed by two hours in We're Heathrow. perfect. It's perfect. So, Avera, Fall Tufa, Ifig, Yvonne Nidiolik is Anam Dom. Mayor, elected members, officials, Yvonne Daly is my name. I work in Limerick City and County Council in Ireland. Tonight I'm here as the tour leader of the school exchange between Thoman Community College and Wilcox High School and Santa Clara High School. I'm just going to get the group to introduce themselves to you. We we'll start here. You stand up and just say your names. If you want to say it in the microphone, so yeah. those of us at home, home, our home audience is watching. I'm Sister Bridget O'Connell. Welcome, Welcome back. <laughs> I'm Neve Harrison. Welcome. Don Donald Doody. Donald, welcome. There are our three teachers, so I'm just going to bring up the students to introduce themselves. We have Please, yes, them we'd like to meet them. I'm Zoe O'Donovan. I'm Sarah O'Hagan. I'm Kira Tobin. I'm Tanya Lane. I'm Anne Marie O'Brien. I'm Stephen Hennessy. Casey Hayes. Hi, my name's Victoria. I'm Rachel Murphy. I'm Holly O'Riordan. I'm Luke Grave. <laughs> I'm Nikita Daly. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. So we have 10 girls and two boys on our tour, and these are our teachers here in the front row here. So Welcome. we're just going to move on to the first slide there of the history of our exchanges. So as you can see here, in 2009, Wilcox came to Limerick. 2010, Solutions came to Santa Clara. 2011, Santa Clara High School came to Limerick. 2012, St. Clemens Redemptress came to Santa Clara High School. 2013, Santa Clara High School came to Limerick. And in 2017, with Toma Community College coming here, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, the next slide, please. We have a fabulous picture here, compliments of one of your council members, actually. Ansha, <laughs> Cathy. Um, Limerick and Santa Clara began sister city relationships on the 6th of August, 2014. Limerick City and County Council signed a memorandum of understanding with Santa Clara, California, to formulate a sister city relationship in a bid to strengthen economic and civic ties between the two cities. Coherlock Councillor Kevin Sheehan of Limerick was joined at the Sister Cities International Conference in San Jose, California by Mayor of Santa Clara, Jamie Matthews. To sign the agreement with James an increase to economic development, cultural exchanges, educational opportunities, and technical exchanges between both cities on the 6th of August, 2014. I am now going to pass you over to our teacher, Donald Doody, who is going to continue this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I've been asked just to talk to you about, um, about where, we're, where we're from, mm -hmm. Ireland, Limerick, and our, and our um, school, Thoman Community College. Just started with a, uh, a showing Ireland compared to the United States. You can see we're tiny, we're tiny. So, and you can see everything from here. So, if you, um, so th this is the Republic of Ireland, and it has a population of um, one point. Actually, if you, if you could click, yeah, it's um, 4.7 million, and uh, the capital city is, is Dublin, which has a population of 1.2 million. Um, and even around this, the, the capital, there's a huge amount. Uh, probably half the population is just around Dublin. The the, the national language is actually uh, Gaelga, Irish. But isn't, isn't spoken the, 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 too much. English is the most common language. And you can see that there's only seven small areas that actually speak Irish on a day-to-day -day basis. But it is our national language. And you, you see it on all our signs. All our official documents are in English and Irish. Um, it, the, the island of Ireland, and, and, and I do say the island of Ireland, is divided into um, four provinces and 32 counties. Um, you can see there's, um, there's uh, Leinster, uh, Connacht, uh, yeah, Connacht, Munster, and Ulster, which is uh, Munster, that's Munster, and then Ulster is the last. Now, Ulster is a, sp a special, special case to a certain extent because the six counties in the north are, are a self-ruled part of, of Great Britain. They don't, and that's why it's the I, I speak of the island of Ireland rather than the Republic of Ireland in, the, in that, that case. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you wouldn't mind. So, and we're from, 
Uh, yeah, if you, and that's us. That's Limerick. <laughs> so there we are. And that's that's the, the flag of Limerick. So um, uh, again, actually, if you wouldn't mind. Sorry, there's, there's lots of clicking. I'm afraid. So the, the population of Limerick is ninety thousand, which I, I think is it's a little bit smaller than than, than Santa Clara. Um, it's, uh, but it's Ireland's third largest city. We we, we don't do big cities. Um, it was established. It's about it's almost a thousand years old. It was established in. in 922 AD by the Vikings, and it was basically to invade the rest of Ireland. They established in uh, they established in Limerick, and I suppose what what, what we, I tried to do here was trying to give you some contrast to, to what you'd see in Limerick compared to somewhere like Santa Clara. And you can see if you um, uh, that that the on the next on the next one you'll see that, like Saint Mary's Cathedral was built in 1168, and there's King John's Castle, which is built in 12, uh, 1200, and, and a lot of the architecture. The other major architecture you'd see, which you would see in, in some parts some parts of America, is is uh, Georgian uh, architecture, which you do mm. see in certain parts of uh, certain parts of America. So I suppose that they're, they're the, the similarities and the contrast between the two uh, the two cities. Um, now, the best way to see anything is, is with a video, I suppose. So what, what um, this is a video of of, uh, of Limerick. <coughs> One major thing missing from that video, rain. Hmm. Lots of rain. <laughs> it, 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 there's no rain in it, and, and that's not the case. There's lots of rain. So, so it's uh, time to book all our flights. <laughs> yeah, oh, we're ready well, for to that go. weather, yes. <laughs> um, so actually, I think you, 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 you. Yeah, you could actually move on. Yeah, thank you. So um, <laughs> the other thing, because I suppose it's an educational exchange, we uh, I, I just thought we'd talk a bit about the structure of the Irish education system and then a little bit about the school, and uh, I'll be finished then. We, um, we have primary school, which is from, from 5 to, uh, to 12, and then the students go to, to, um, to secondary school from 12 to 18. Now, um, and they've state exams in, third, in, in the third year of secondary school and sixth year. And the results of their final uh, exam or what's the side that decides the competition for universities, university places. Um, the education is compulsory up to age 16 in Ireland, but we have 90% of students would go, would finish secondary school up to, uh, up to 18. And then I suppose one of the other major differences at third level, um, where um, third level would be free, well, there's a, there's a minimum cost to go to third level in Ireland. And for even something like subsistence or, or, or your day-to-days, you can get grants to, to uh, for if, if uh, under certain conditions to... Uh, to pay for your upkeep during um, uh, during the, your university, so that's just a little bit on the uh, on the education system. And the next slide then is is just a brief introduction to the school. So yeah, that's uh, yeah. So uh, our school, unlike I, I know that the two schools we're visiting here are, are huge compared to what we have. We have four hundred ninety three students compared to I think two thousand for the students here. So it's a small school. It, it's actually an amalgamation of two schools, uh, Salishans 
um, uh, Solution as, um, um, and St. Nessence Community College. Um, and it's under the umbrella of what, what, what's called the Limerick and Clare Education Training Board, which is similar to the, um, the, the, the school board here. There's, I think you have 28 schools under the board uh, over here. And as a community college, which is not the same in all schools in Ireland, but we'd offer a very wide range of subjects, technology, coding, music, art, and then Irish, the, the Irish language is compulsory for, for all students, and um, geography, history, and business. So again, I thought the video was the best way to, uh, to show this. Our students did up a video for, for the trip, and so it's only, again, it's, I think it's a two minute video, and then I'm, I'm done, so. Hello and welcome to Thomond Community College in the north side of Limerick City. We have made this short film to sum up how great our school is. Thank you for watching the video. We hope you like it. <laughs> that was great. Oh. Very nice. <laughs> that's, there's just one more. And so that's, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you back in Ireland in 2018. Some mm -hmm. of you in Thank you. I hope Thank so you. too. You did a phenomenal job, Donald, for very little sleep, it looks like. So, <laughs> wow, amazing. Um, we just want to make some presentations. I have one here from our um, mayor, Stephen Keary, who would like to present you with something from all the way from Ireland, Lisa, so if I can give you this. And then I'm gonna call in Bridget. She has a plaque from the school that she wants to give you as well. Okay. Um, I can just give you something. Oh. oh, we're gonna do a presentation, well, Yvonne. Wait, we're wait, gonna do a big wait, thing. Wait, wait, yeah. Could you hold that just for a minute? Because yeah. we're going to come down too, and we'll do them all together. I just have a couple of comments from council members, and then we'll we'll exchange our gifts because okay. we have some for you too, and and the children. So, uh, Councilmember Davis. First of all, Yvonne, thank you for coming back. I know this has been a couple of years for you, and I'm happy to see you again. And Sister Bridget, DSW. Yes. <laughs> Big words for us. Yes. What was that, nine pairs of sneakers you bought back to uh, Ireland? <laughs> Just only one, are you sure? That bag was pretty big. Um, so hopefully we'll get to steal you. Um, we had a chance to go to Ireland, uh, former Mayor Mahan and I, and we had a great time in your city. And I wanna go back, I mean, just watching the video, it was just, you just wanna go back. I mean, it's a place, it's magical, we had so much fun. I can't tell you all the, 
the details, but we landed in Dublin and we had a great time and we were in Limerick and in Belfast. So it was just wonderful. But the, the hospitality that you showed us in Limerick was awesome. And I hope that we do go back. I think we owe you a visit according to your little timeline there. We definitely need to be back there. But um, thank you students. I know this was a long flight. I know you guys are all tired, but we do have like little gifts for you to go and we'll turn this over to the mayor. But I just wanna thank you so much for coming back again this year. Thank you. Councilmember Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor. Cade Mil Falcha. Um, a thousand welcomes. It's in, in Gaelic, that's a, a thousand welcomes. Uh, I'm so happy to see you. It really means a lot to me to, to see you here tonight and after such a long, long day. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, spending some time in Limerick uh, this summer. I was there in August and spent some time with Yvonne and Sister Bridget and had a lovely dinner with Kieran Lahan and got to meet your mayor and several of, your, the, other, of the other executives of Limerick City. Uh, got to see St. Jo uh, John's Castle. And uh, my daughter and my husband were with me as well, and we had a lovely time. The weather actually held up, and uh, so we really got to enjoy the city. But, uh, and we have uh, very nice weather uh, ahead of you. You've got very nice weather ahead of you while you're here. I hope you brought some short sleeve shirts and lots of suntan lotion because we know the fair Irish skin. You have to be very careful with your fair <laughs> Irish skin. So, but, uh, but it really is great to see you and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow night at, at dinner and getting to know you a little bit better. But, but welcome and get a good night's rest. No, we ordered the sun. We knew they were coming, uh. right? We, put it, we said, hey, high 80s, low 90s, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Mayhan. Thank you. I do believe it was the last time I saw Sister Bridget was in DSW and along with all the young women from Salesians. And I, you boosted the local economy that day. I do remember that. Uh, and I have visited Limerick. It's a beautiful city. And for those of us who are Irish, I mean, even just half, my name reveals my Irish ancestry, even though my looks... Do not. You can't be any part of Irish without knowing that Ireland may be tiny, but it is mighty. I think Ireland is purported to have civilized the whole world, right? And Limerick is a beautiful city. It's a city that blends the ancient with the modern. It reveres its history and yet it embraces the latest technology, as that the video showed of your of your um, community college there. And so it's it's a great honor to be a sister city with Limerick. And I'm so glad that our early visits with our sister cities, uh, when we went there early on and met with the mayor, met with Karen, to try to establish some groundwork, I'm so glad that it finally came to fruition. It took a while, but it was worth the wait, and I welcome all of you to Santa Clara. I hope you enjoy your visit. Are there many um, first-time visitors to the United States and California here in the delegation? Oh, there's all one. Right. Oh. All right, great. Um, well, we hope you have a wonderful time. We know uh, this is just hello for now. We're going to be joining you for dinner tomorrow evening, and um, we hope you enjoy your stay here, and we're here for you. But we, uh, if I could ask the council to join me down here, we have some gifts for you, that some we'd like you to bring back for, to Ireland, and some you can enjoy right here. So. So this is our city flag that is um, signed uh, for the mayor of Limerick. If Thank you, you very would much. please deliver that to course. him. And this is the gift from the city of Santa Clara to the mayor. Perfect. Of, no problem. Thank Limerick. you very much. Thank you. And then. Uh, right. Perfect. With dated. Oh. <laughs> okay. Should I dance here? Yeah. It's on nervous. This is for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a surprise goodie bag. Thanks, we love surprises. Yeah. <laughs> we like giving surprises. Yeah.
And then for all of these students, we have these bags. Oh, over here. <laughs> um, on behalf of our mayor, Stephen Keary, at home in Limerick City and County Council, we'd like to present you some Limerick lace. You can't go wrong with that. So there you go. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, look at that. And a lovely limerick.ie bag to put it into to mind it until later. Oh, and just a letter from the mayor for you. Oh, thank you so much. So there much. you go. Thank, thank you, you very much. So, so Bridge is going to present you as well. Okay. So if you want to come to... So, Mayor, on behalf of Eugene O'Brien, the principal of Thoman Community College, the staff and all the students, we'd like to present you with this, pla with this plaque just in, as a um, reminder of the fact that we were at this meeting and as a sign of the welcome back when you see it. All right, thank you.
I'm getting evaluated by the dean. Are you going? Thank you, everyone, for your patience and indulgence with us for that. Mickey Mouse is here. We're next. Agenda. Okay, the uh, next order of business is going to be item 13E1 that we pulled from the consent calendar. And that item is... Uh, uh, routine written petition for approval, and that is the City of Santa Clara's Parks and Recreation Performance Dance Team request for championship team funding and authorization to transfer $7,450 for travel expenses to perform in the 2017 Disneyland Merry Holiday Parade in Anaheim, California on December 8th through 10th. Uh, staff recommendation is approval. Do we have a representative from the dance team? Or, I'm sorry, we'll start. Are you the representative for the dance team? <laughs> I'd Where love are to learn. Your ears? I'd love to learn how to dance. Okay. It's uh, so, uh, our proud uh, uh, position to introduce Linnea uh, Sheehy, who's been uh, with the Recreation and Parks Department for over 25 years. Uh, members of the community definitely know her. Uh, some of them have been dancing with uh, her since they were two years old. So 84% um, of our uh, uh, dance team is a uh, Santa Clara resident or participant in the school district. So again, uh, we thank you for your opportunity and, and, and uh, support of their program. They'll represent Santa Clara very well, uh, Main Street, uh, Disneyland. So Linnea? We know her as Miss Linnea. Miss yeah, Linnea. Yeah, she's Miss Linnea. <laughs> yeah. All my friends have danced. I mean, all my children have danced in her class. Yes, classes, they have. So. Yes, Thank welcome. you so much welcome. for having us tonight. Um, on behalf of the Santa Clara Dance Team, we would like to show you a little preview of what to expect for the Disney dancing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd also like to thank you for considering funding our program. Side note, little friend in the front here. Raise your hand. Kaylee. Raise your hand, Kaylee. And where's Kelsey? I think we recognize them, do don't we? Do we recognize them? Yes, I think so. Yes, we do. Okay, I so think so. here we go. And welcome, dance team. Christmas song. <laughs> Whoa. 
Thank you very much. We're very excited to represent the city of Santa Clara at Disneyland. Um, and I don't know if everybody understands, but there are going to be 900 dancers from all over the world. And we're very excited that we were selected to be a part of this program. So thank you again for your consideration. That's amazing. And, and I'm sure you're going to represent us very well. We're so proud of you. And I think that dance probably deserves a thumbs up here <laughs> and, and a positive vote. So what it, we'll, we're still waiting, though. We have to, we have to check the light. So. Uh, Councilmember Davis, you had a comment? Ms. Liana, I would love to make the motion to give you the money to go to Disneyland and bring back the gold. <laughs> <laughs> There's a motion, is there a second? Second. Motion second. Lights on the motion. And that passes unanimously, congratulations. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing them. It's always nice to have some joy in this council chamber. <laughs> All right. Okay, next on the agenda, we have the approval of the consent calendar. All items are approved with one motion. Motion to approve. Unless there's any items to be uh, with, uh, taken off. So, Council Member O'Neill, you have an item? Well, I think. I think staff's prepared. I think we're going to look at 13A5 separately. Yes. And thir so we have 13A5, and thir I have a request for 13B6. Second the motion. Any other um, requests? Oh, did we do that already? 13B5 was pulled for November 7th. Right? 13. So A6. we are going to hear 13A5, and then I had a request. Oh, instead of B6, or also B6? B6 is been. I have, um, yeah. B so we have 13A5 and 13B6. Is there any other items? OK, seeing none, is there a motion on the balance of the consent calendar? I made the motion, Dominic second. second. Motion second. Lights on the motion. And that passes Happy. unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is public presentations. City Clerk, do you have any cards for public presentations? And these are for items not on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, Kurt Vartan, an item not on the agenda. Good evening. Evening. Um, I have a little presentation. It's a very uh, brief overview. Could this be about your trip? Uh, a little bit. Okay. So it's a very, very brief overview. So brief. this is all online, so you can see it when you see it. I'm going to cover four things. Bikes, buildings, placemaking, and weed, all in, from Amsterdam. So for bikes, you'll see Amsterdam is full of bikes. It, it has an incredibly uh, diverse, uh, eclectic, uh, and very dense, po dense, dense bike population. Uh, very interesting configurations. Uh, this is a gentleman with his kid and his groceries uh, tooling around uh, Amsterdam. Pretty, pretty cool. Bike lockers. This is a free service that comes down. Uh, very, very intense uh, usage of bikes in the city. Next is buildings. Buildings, these are uh, moderate density buildings. These are all over the city. You won't see any single family homes. They're all uh, large, you know, four, five, six story buildings mostly. Um, one really cool one, that's actually not a building. That's what's going to be there when they're done building it. So it was like a, a, a screen in front of it. Really, really cool. Um, and then placemaking is which really why I was there. Uh, there was 46 countries represented internationally and over 400 participants. All placemakers focus on the same incredible things. Uh, this is an amazing statistic out of Australia. Loneliness kills as many people as heart disease and smoking. Just, it's, it's, uh, it's frightening. Uh, these are just different examples of placemaking and how to create places in, in the public realm. Rotterdam, actually, their staff asked the conference to be a part of their city and solicited information. And we presented and actually gave feedback on some of their designs uh, in the city. It was really, really cool. Uh, tons and tons of presentations that were given. Um, 
that was this was that was my uh, uh, oops. That was the presentation that I gave. Um, but there's just tons and tons of information that was presented. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, but just to let you know that this was, you know, a very, very full conference, and uh, I hope to be able to share uh, information at some point in the future. They took us on tours of the area to show various things that create great places for people to go to, um, and uh, just really fun stuff. Uh, coffee shops. This is where you get your dispense, similar to what dispensaries are. They are not isolated in aspects uh, in, in the city. They are completely integrated. These are the little circles. Find the coffee shop. Okay, this is, these, this is where you get your cannabis in, in the city. Flower stores on the market, they sell seeds so you can grow. This, they sell drinks, food, and weed. Uh, find the coffee shop, find the coffee shop, find the coffee shop. It's, it's just they're completely integrated into the fabric of, of the city. And it's, and it's, it's not a social uh, you know, oddity. And the last thing I would put up there is Creating a great city uh, can be done, and I'm, I'm wondering if we can do that with something like City Place. How can some of these ideas um, in a city like this be incorporated? Thank you so much for the time. Wow, that was quick. Thank you. A lot of information there. Thank you for representing Santa Clara and Amsterdam. All right. Uh, any other public presentations? Please come forward. I don't have any other cards for public presentation. Give them right there. Did you? Where are they? Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Got stopped. Um, Debbie, why don't you go ahead, sure. and then I'll go through the cards. I just want to um, recognize that I got, I think it's our second city manager's blog report. And I really want to say thank you for doing that. And for those people who haven't read it yet, or haven't seen it, or aren't subscribed to it, it's a wonderful tool that our new city manager is putting out and basically gives you a great overview of what's happened. It looks like she's going to use that as a tool to answer some of the questions that come out of city council meetings. And I just want to commend you for doing that. I think it's a great tool and sure happy you're here and I'm sure happy to see that tool being used. So it's an added girl and I think it's wonderful. Thanks so much for that. So anybody who hasn't seen it, sign up, get it read it wherever you can find it. I'm not sure. I just get it in my mailbox every week, and it's wonderful to be able to read what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Lane, and then Tomio Izu. Uh, oh, okay. you have cards? Yeah, I have cards. Is my Yours card is here. Yeah, Always your card's card. here. I'll call you up in a minute. Scott first, and then Tomio after that. Hello, uh, Mayor, City Council, new city manager. Um, yeah, I, Scott Lane here. I just wanted to commend also um, what, what has been done with a fresh air. This is on top of what the city council has been doing with a lot of triage work. As a lot of us were trying to work both on that side of the, of the dais and this side, world class is what we should seek. And really that's what I think the theme tonight is. Anything is possible in Santa Clara, that's what we're saying. So we need to reach out to our folks. We need to be more transparent. We need to have crowdsourcing. We need to have people at the seat of the table with decision making. Um, there will be other discussions both tonight and others about specific presentations or specific companies or developments. But really, I think why there's been so much contention of all these developments is we've never had the global picture and the global education for all the folks in the city of Santa Clara and our neighboring cities, uh, Sunnyvale, Milpita, San Jose, to understand that we're all in this together. We are going to be growing approximately 30%. We're going to add at least 800,000 new housing units, but we're already short 350,000 housing units in the Bay Area. So what is our role? How do we have a quality of life? How do we build up our city to pay for all the things that we want to do? How do we also look to say to the public, how do we focus on the almost $800 million of unfunded pension liabilities, both emergency and non-emergency, and the city of Santa Clara still has to state what the unfunded medical liability is. The city of Palo Alto said theirs was $150 million. So basically, we have a billion-dollar problem, and I think what we need to do is what a lot of us have been saying for the last five, 10 years, engage the community. The answers are out there. Let's work on it together. Let's come together. and. 
I know a lot of people have poo-pooed San Jose, but they made a lot of very tough choices that they had to make. And no other city, probably in the Bay Area, had as much chutzpah as San Jose to try to make those tough choices. Was it the right way to do it? Maybe, maybe not. Is it the right choice for Santa Clara? Maybe, maybe not. But at least the engagement and the debate and the discussion has to come on. Because I think if we all uh, are in this together, uh, like what was said in the placemaking, it's not just what we want. What do we need to do? People for decades have come here as a land of opportunity. We don't want to shut the door. We don't want to be like they were in North Dakota when they had the oil boom that said, if you don't have a house or a camper, don't come. Well, guess what? Look at the Santa Rosa fires. We don't have enough housing. We lost 6,000 housing units in literally days. We have no resiliency in, in our system. So we need to reach out to people. We need to bridge gaps. We need to foster collaboration and not contention. And I think we can do it. And I think we've been doing it well. And I think there's a nice new fresh, breath of fresh air as well. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Tomio, please come forward. And then Stephen Hazel after that. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Sorry. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomio Hayasi Izu, and I'm here on behalf of the Greenbelt Alliance. And with the recent flurry of activity and new developments popping up along El Camino Real and really all the way across the city, um, I just wanted to restate the importance of working together to do everything possible to address the current housing crisis here in the Bay Area. Well, I'm sure that you all have your hands full, uh, we, just wanted to, we also wanted to recognize some of your recent efforts, especially in regards to the El Camino Real planning process and the proposed uh, housing impact fee. And of course, we look forward to potentially working with you in the future to further these efforts and make Santa Clara, uh, Santa Clara City a great place to live, work, and play. Um, of course, we also want to continue to encourage the city to, um, to look for opportunities to create affordable and sustainable housing uh, near jobs and transit, as we see this is essential in addressing, the housing, addressing housing affordability, providing opportunities for walkable um, neighborhoods, and of course, reducing pressure for sprawl development along the outskirts of our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Tomio. Uh, Stephen Hazel, please come forward. After that, I don't have any cards. If anybody wants to speak, they can queue right up. Yes. Good evening, sir. Just to uh, set the atmosphere, a member of the Occupy protest, the FBI staged a murder to clear it. They used a guy named Dakota to clear the Occupy protest, okay? I was there, I watched it live. Channel 3 went over, it was phony. Okay, this is where I get to my mother, my, you know my sister? They murdered my mother, my sister last year. You know that, you know Kimberly? My, went to Bookstore High School, valedictorian in 76, one to seven, they murdered her. You know why? Because Iris Chang was murdered also. During the Peterson case, one of the guys there that murdered, was there at the trial. He was a fed, yeah. And guess what, I went 10 years later to the family over there in Cupertino, she's buried over there. You know Iris Chang, she's famous. She was actually murdered. They tried to say it was a suicide. Guess what? One little Chinese guy, dark guy, showed up. At the, I was there. He, he was there at the grave site twice. Unbelievable. Hey, you know what they wanted to tell you? This is it. Watch. Listen, you guys. True story. American public. Moses, when he's coming down from the mountain, he's wearing sandals. He slips. He drops the tablets. They break in two. Guess what? Two corners are left. Thousand years later, the Saudis find them. They do. They've got them at Mecca. And you know what they do? They do the backwards. They go like this. They found out, whoa, if I go backwards, everything emanates from the west coast of Africa. All the, everything. All the negative stuff like that. Uh, Patricia, it's your cancer. That comes from the Saudis. That's it. They cause everything. Yeah, it's Mecca. It's, it's that. It's the weather. It's everything. They pray five times. They said, you know why? That's what San Bernardino was. They picked 12 too, you know why? That was Enron. That was the date they officially went under. That was the mass that day, yeah. They've been planning to plant the bomb, then, then they, the waves of people, it's true. But you know, there's a way to cut this. These guys don't want to tell the public that guess what, if that exists, guess what? The Ark exists, it's in Iraq. I know where it's at, it's in Kirkut. Yes, there was a house that got hit. It was a 10-year-old in Chico, not too long ago, and it kind of looks like the front. I know where it's at. If, you, if the corners are there, the ark exists, okay? And it's like two corners. It's like I got Iman, remember, Asama and Iman, one, two, and I got Ailes and Ancelin Scalia. It's like a book. The two dirtbags, and all the pages are in between, which means Bush and Cheney. Yeah, Bush and Cheney went in with the Saudis. And the government knows this, and they know I have, and they killed my mom and my sister. 
Yes. They both were murdered. It's like Deb Rose and Amy Fisher, but they murdered him. They murdered him. I was in, I'm going to give you a paper right now. I was in Redding, California, and they attacked me. I went, and they changed the police chief. I was the one. The next day, they changed the police chief. Look, I, I won $3,004. Look at it, at the lottery. They're going to attack me. Here, I'm going to give you a copy. I won it, and I won the date, uh, Donald Trump, 326, the date, 11 8 won 10, 10 straights. Look right here. Here's the lottery right here. Right here. It's right there. The feds. I want to tell you, it's more about numbers. Thank you, Mr. Here's Hazel. Here's my birth certificates. Thank 12, you. 6. Officer 6, 12, Bush. Thank you. Thank you He's very much, devil. sir. He's the devil. I'm God. Yeah. Thank you. They Thank know you, it. sir. Any other uh, public presentations? Yeah, Please Mecca. It's, it's a military thank you, weapon. Thank you, Mr. Hazel. Against everybody. It's a military yeah. weapon against all of us. Mr. Yeah. Hazel, thank you. Anybody? Uh, any other public presentations? Okay, seeing none, we have consent items pulled for discussion. The first is 13A5, uh, which is to note and file the initiation of community outreach in preparation of a request for development proposals process for city-owned properties. Mr. Crabtree. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. I have a brief presentation just to, uh, to summarize what this is and make one correction. Um, so what we're here today is just asking for your concurrence through the note and file for a proposed uh, community outreach and uh, request for development proposals program for three properties that are, the city owns um, that were purchased for affordable housing development. The, uh, the plan is to go out to the community in November and December, um, possibly into January with uh, community engagement activities, to do some workshops, kind of understand where the community is in terms of, of uh, potential development that could occur on the sites, and then based on that, uh, go forward with a request for development proposals. Uh, just to walk through quickly, the one site is 3575 De La Cruz Boulevard, and in the uh, report, uh, there was an error in the exhibit that the, the site was not highlighted, the, the little, where it says site and box was missing from the exhibit. So I just wanna correct and, and make sure that it's clear that that's the, the property in question. Uh, the second site is 2330 Monroe Street, San Tomas and Monroe. And then the third site is um, at 1021, 1031 El Camino Real. Uh, so with that, um, available to uh, answer any questions. Um, Council Member O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your giving us more details of that, Director Crabtree. So um, at this point, so we, these are properties that were purchased specifically for the intention. One of the, the De La Cruz site, I believe, was prior, prior to that was a city uh, um, fire station. Correct. But they, we've retained them or purchased them for the purposes of developing affordable housing. That's correct. And so, and so we don't, at this point, we truly kind of have a blank slate, and that's why we're going to go through the, the community outreach process and then... Uh, I think you're going to have a consultant that will help with that process. That's correct. So ju yeah, just to emphasize, there are, there are no development proposals for any of these at this point. Uh, blank slate. We just want to go out to the community and, and have that opportunity for engagement. We do, we do have a consultant um, that works for us that's going to run those community uh, workshops and so forth and get that input. Okay, great. So thank you. That's awesome. Um, City Attorney, I have a question I should have asked you ahead of time, but I own property near, near the El Camino property. Should I, can I vote on the other two and abstain on anything to do with that? Is this, is, is, or is it within 500 feet of that property? It's close enough that okay. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, yeah. This is really just note and file, so you're really the not, note take, file, you're really not okay? taking any action. So for the record, I just want to say I'm. I'm I mean, you can abstain from the vote if you feel you, you'd like to. Maybe I'll just abstain on the whole thing. Yeah. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, um, any comments? Any members of the public want to speak? Please come forward. So you, you ma'am, you'd have to come forward to the microphone. Thank you, so everyone can hear your question. Thank you. How do we find out the dates and the locations of those community meetings? City manager? We will put out information through my weekly report as well as publish on the website and do the normal noticing. Okay. Did you get that, ma'am? I did. Very helpful. Can we um, 
city manager get more information specifically so she can know exactly where to look uh, for when, uh, because I don't think we have the dates yet. Is that correct? Yeah, we don't actually that, have the dates correct. yet. But yeah, we haven't set dates yet. I'll, I'm welcome your information and then I can make sure that we include you in a notice if you're interested. <laughs> Okay, if we can do that, um, because I know uh, that it's sent out on eNotify, it's put on our website, we use social media, um, and then no, actually written notice within so many feet, if we can extend those boundaries to not just the 500, but at least 1,000 feet or more, uh, so that we that they're fully noticed. So yes. Next door and those kinds of things. All, all the social media sites. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, just a, a, a question of clarification. One of the, the first items they said for guiding principles on, on doing this, um, working with the consultant, um, they talked about uh, development with respecting the uh, existing established neighborhood that's there, the single family homes or whatever that, that's abutting the properties. And I would ask that part of the process be to explore how when conflict arises, because conflict will arise, it already happened on the Monroe site, um, what happens when that when that happens, and what process can be followed to have a deliberate element on how you um, explore those those challenges that will come up in the conflict of the the balance between respecting um, the existing neighborhood and the change that needs to happen on that site to develop it and things like that. So how how does that happen um, in the process? Okay, we'll look at that as well. <coughs> Press. If I can make a suggestion, one of the things that happened with uh, Monroe Street was it wasn't very clear to anyone if what the requirements were that were attached to those properties. For example, is there a requirement that it has to be affordable housing? Is it a requirement that it needs to be below market? or low cost or very low cost and to provide some very detailed information on what those requirements are. I think too many times we've been making assumptions that people understand what it means and some of the staff that was doing it before did not do a good job at explaining to the neighborhood why they were doing it. The outreach was done to, and found the developers before the community was asked. So I'm, I again applaud you for doing it the right way instead of backwards. But if you would make it very clear that this property will be developed or we want to develop it and what strings are attached to it, like it must be low cost housing and what does that mean? So people understand what the parameters are. In other words, it can't be a shopping center or it can't be a fire station again. I think that needs to be clear. We haven't done a good job at communicating that at all. Thank you. That's some very good points. Thank you. We'll take that information in. Yes, sir. I just, Scott Lane here, I just want to applaud um, doing this um, in this manner. I think Debbie hit on a lot of good points. You know, one of the challenges that the homeless um, issues have done or below market rate housing, we have wonderful below market rate housing in other cities like San Francisco where I think it, we're really missing opportunities, and I think we probably want to reach to the state of California, is where can we push the envelope? How can we have not just abode services there? How can we have retail in these places so it's a true mixed-use development so the people that live here can actually work there as well? How do we engender so it's not just three strata of below market rate, never interacting with anyone else? It's about serendipity. It's about getting people to prove themselves how they can be a great citizen, a great worker, a great community member. And the fact that we're wanting to do this and get the community involved will, uh, as they call FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt. I think that's a lot of what was happening with the Zabrata process on Monroe. A lot of the people thought, oh my God, 200 homeless people, and their mind went racing. So yes, let's get everyone involved. Let's try to find out what the community wants and, and needs but let's also do whatever we can to engender um, more community involvement. And once again, we're hiring another consultant, so I'm going to ask the question I've been asking for years is we need to have some of this brain trust built into the city. And every time we have a consultant and we don't retain that in the city, we lose some of that from project to project. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. There's a, is there a motion to note and file? Move to note and file. Motion. Second. Motion second to note and file. Lights on the motion, and that passes with one abstention. Thank you.
Okay, the next is, uh, we do both of them? Wait a minute. The B5, B6. 13 B6. Mr. Vartan, you pulled that? So it's approval of additional appropriations of $194,870 to the Tasman East specific plan project funded by a transfer from the building inspection reserves account and approval of amendment number one to the agreement for professional services with Perkins and Will Inc. to complete the Tasman East specific plan and environmental impact report increasing the not to exceed cost by $194,870 to revise total of $954,295. Mr. Bartan. Uh, thanks, thanks for hearing me on this. Um, with regard to Tasman East, since it has such a, a opportunity to impact the whole city place area and round it out as both a livable and workable, shoppable place, uh, if you're gonna increase the consultant's um, scope or, or time and dollars, um, I, maybe there's an opportunity to inject a little bit of um, how can we uh, increase the, the value that's created there, not just to look at um, how can we cram 4,000 apartments in there or, or housing units or 4,500, but how can we do so in a way that is progressive, that looks to how we create the kind of environment we want to create in terms of uh, more pedestrian focused, less car dependent, and more, um, uh, more walkable. And uh, some of the things that I, I presented earlier in terms of what maybe Amsterdam does in terms of how they lay out their streets, this is almost like a blank slate in the area. And I was hoping that since we're, we're kind of adding on to the consultant's time, uh, maybe they can look at how we can in incorporate some of the uh, pedestrian focused features uh, in that area and really how can it support uh, the city place uh, dynamic and, and looking at uh, car free zones and things like that. And, and really uh, de-emphasizing the personally owned automobile. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Sec motion second. All right, lights on the motion. And that passes, oh, just one off the dais by six. Thank you. Okay, any, uh, let's see, next item we have is unfinished business. I don't see any unfinished business. Uh, next we have the item set for hearing. And the item is uh, 2232 to 2240 El Camino Real adoption of resolutions to adopt the negative, adopt the mitigated negative declaration and adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the El Camino Real residential project and approve the rezoning from community commercial to plan development to allow a four story mixed use development with 17,909 square feet of commercial floor area and 151 senior apart apartment units, including the additional conditions of approval as recommended by the planning commission and agreed by the applicant. So we're gonna declare the public hearing open. And Mr. Crabtree. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. I'm Andrew Crabtree, Director of Community Development. And as just um, mentioned, this is a request to rezone the subject property. The subject property, which is located at 2232-2240 El Camino Real, that's uh, in between El Camino Real and Ana Drive, uh, near the uh, the Sprouts Target Shopping Center, uh, just to the west of McCormick. Um, the existing uses on the site include the Verizon Store, Academy for Salon Professionals, uh, Mayuri Indian Re Restaurant. There was uh, Calmar Bicycles there as well. The, uh, the proposed project is a senior housing mixed-use development, includes um, 151 uh, senior apartment units. Those would be uh, age-restricted to residents of 55 years or older in age um, in perpetuity. Uh, it's a legal requirement. Um, the, property also, the project would also include uh, 17,909 square feet of commercial uh, floor area. Uh, I believe that would accommodate uh, the Verizon store would move back in. There are other uses might move back in as well. 
Um, there's a proposal that the project could include a senior, I'm sorry, excuse me, a community meeting room of 12,020 square feet, 1,220 square feet if the uh, council gives that direction. Um, otherwise, it could be retail space. So um, adjacent uses are commercial and some multifamily um, as well. Um, and then the, the Western Hotel, the bank would remain. The project also includes uh, 3,495 square feet uh, in an open plaza area. There's about uh, 5,775 square feet of amenity space for the residents. There are 270 parking spaces proposed for the project. Um, those are divided up so that there are 191 uh, dedicated for residential use and 86 for the retail. And this was an item, uh, an issue that was discussed extensively at the Planning Commission hearing as well. Uh, there are a number, this is a, a parking ratio of approximately 1.25 uh, parking spaces per unit for the residential. There are a number of market studies that were provided looking at senior housing, which is uh, a mix of uh, smaller units and so forth that have supported that that's a, 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 more than a sufficient uh, parking supply for the project. In our review, uh, we look at general plan consistency. The uh, general plan, which was adopted um, seven years ago through a, a community-based process, you know, including many workshops and, and opportunities for community input, uh, reflecting the, the entirety of Santa Clara, um, is the city's vision for long-term land uses. And when we look at new development, we review it against that general plan for consistency. The, uh, the general plan calls for the redevelopment of the El Camino Real Corridor, um, intensification with higher density mixed use development. The general plan also includes uh, several policies that promote uh, senior housing and allows for senior housing at really any density. But I would note that this project is, um, as proposed, would conform with the uh, designee density designation for the site, even if it were not age restricted. So even if they came in with a, a, a regular project, they would meet the density and they don't need to take advantage of the provision that allows for higher density for senior housing. Either way, it fully conforms. It also conforms with the uh, requirement that's in the general plan for commercial development. The general plan specifies a certain amount of commercial square footage that would need to be on the site and this project ex exceeds that amount. Um, so in terms of is it following what the city has said is its plan and vision for the site, the project is completely consistent with that. There was an environmental review process um, for this project as required under the California Environmental Quality Act, and the city uh, issued a mitigated negative declaration. The one thing of significance to note is that the, the project, there was you know, in-depth traffic analysis for that. And um, based on that analysis, the, the project would not add to existing traffic conditions um, as proposed without any um, measures to reduce traffic. It would not create, it would actually reduce traffic over the existing uses on the site in the PM in the evening uh, peak hour time. And then with the uh, implementation of uh, measures in the project and other um, advantages that it has based on its location, it would actually reduce traffic levels over the existing use in both the morning and the evening. And there have been a number of uh, community meetings around this project site going back to the prior um, application that was before the city council um, in March. And at each of these meetings, the, um, the applicant has, after each of these meetings, the applicant has made changes to the project to address uh, community concerns. Um, some of these, from their most notable, uh, comparing it with the previous project that the city council considered in March. I'll just walk through those in summary. The uh, project before was 151 market rate units. Um, based on input that the applicant received from city council and the community, they've come back now with a proposal to do the age-restricted senior apartments. Um, there was considerable discussion at the last meeting about the height of the building. So the applicant reduced it by one story um, from five to four stories. There was discussion about the amount of retail and the applicant has increased the amount of retail in response to that. 
and added it on the Ana Drive uh, frontage as well as the El Camino frontage. They've also um, offered up the uh, community room and they've um, increased the amount of amenity space. Uh, it's notable that the mix of one and two bedroom units has changed so that there would be more uh, smaller bedrooms. Um, that's kind of consistent with reducing the height of the, the structure. It's overall, there's less square footage. Um, and then consistent with it being uh, a smaller building and a senior project, there are some fewer parking spaces. The project they're also offering to provide some traffic calming measures um, to benefit the adjacent neighborhood. So uh, for the reasons we've discussed, the project's fully consistent with our city's general plan um, that we put out there to, to guide future development. It is responsive to a community input that we've heard through a number of different venues, very responsive. Um, it would meet a, a real need uh, for housing for seniors in our community. Uh, there are numerous you know, demographic studies that show that there's a growing need um, for this type of housing. Uh, we know anecdotally of people that are on waiting lists for market rate senior housing that you know, want to live in this area as seniors and are looking for this type of development. Uh, the project would provide various community benefits and as has been analyzed, it does not have any traffic or other environmental impacts that would result from its approval. The uh, Planning Commission considered the project on September 13th and they recommended approval of the project. Uh, they added some conditions that have been incorporated into the project. The developer agreed to the, the first five uh, conditions here on this list, which have been added in. Uh, the project would have the 25 electrical vehicle charging stalls. They would provide the city with a parking survey, a survey of, of the residents to verify that they are in fact senior as required. And that's actually also reflecting a, a, a federal requirement that they have to report as well to the federal government. They would um, provide us with uh, traffic analysis sort of to verify if it is in fact conforming with what they've said. And if uh, they do not, then they have to look at measures that they can implement to increase the amount of people that are not driving um, or reduce the traffic, I should say. And then there was a condition as well uh, to eliminate the parking along El Camino Real that was proposed by the Planning Commission. Uh, staff is not recommending that be incorporated in this project. It's really something that should be studied more on a holistic basis for the corridor if the uh, council so desires. And so with that, uh, staff is recommending approval of the rezoning uh, from community commercial to plan development and adoption of the mitigated negative declaration and the mitigation monitoring and reporting program and I'm available for any questions you might have. Uh, questions from the council? I have a question, um, Andrew, about parking. So um, is any of the parking that's reserved for the commercial part of the development used to supplement the requirement for the residential part of the development? So the way the parking is all allocated, each unit would have a dedicated space. And then there's an additional pool of parking spaces that would be reserved for the residential use on sort of a um, um, we call it unbundled um, market-based basis. So as you know, residents move in and say, we need that second parking space, um, those could be assigned to them. Then the remainder is really, uh, well, there's some for visitors, for the residents, and then the remainder for the commercial is set aside. It's really intended to be for the, to support the commercial use. So how many spaces are available? Is it for purchase? Or if you're a resident and you want that second space, how, how does that work? And what, what would be available? Yeah. So there are 23 uh, spaces in that pool that are um, available. And I think the, um, the applicant could clarify that how they would exactly market those. But that's my understanding is that typically it's you know when you move in and there's one of those spaces are available, you can request it and would pay for an additional fee. Um, and, and then that would be assigned to that unit. That's typically how uh, unbundled parking works. And then, so the spaces for the retail are, are dedicated only for retail? That's correct. That's the intent. The 86 be reserved for commercial use. And you know, residents would have to register their cars so that you know, they're known as to who, whose cars are whose. 
So is there a um, is there a study for the park? I think you said something about a study for the parking. Right. If yeah, there actually, tell me how that works and when that happens. Sure. So so the they go and look at other senior development of this type and survey. You know, usually they go late in the night, early morning, when most residents would be home, and they count simply count you know on different nights how many cars are there on the development as a ratio to the number of units. And they looked at half a dozen different projects in the area. And, and based on that, um, you know, the, this would have a higher parking ratio than what was observed to be the actual demand in, in other projects. Is there any, um, is there any solutions if it, if it turns out that it's not the case once the project is built? Sure. If it turns out there isn't enough parking? Right. Um, well, there are long-term solutions, you know, you could certainly look at working with them to secure additional parking um, through some sort of like cooperative. We have commercial uses nearby that again would have different demand times. And so, you know, the, the developer could be asked to, to, uh, to go and secure additional parking spaces that would be available for the project in the evening. Um, and again, we could also look at working with them to see if there are other um, incentives that they could provide to their residents to reduce the demand for uh, parking spaces and for driving amongst their residents. Right, because parking is an issue over there, that whole town center, and we just don't want um, residents parking in the neighborhoods because they don't want to buy the second space or because they don't, you know, because it's easier that way. So, I mean, that's just human nature, so. And so, and um, I think the intent is, you know, again, to look at offering you know, measures like van pools or transit passes, things like that, that they could offer to the residents to reduce the demand if the, the surveys come in showing that the, the project's not uh, satisfy, uh, satisfying the actual need. Okay, thank you. Does any other council member have any questions? Council member O'Neill? Uh, yes, I, there's some, been some, you know, questions that have come in based on the um, accuracy of the, the the traffic studies is the applicant going to talk to that, or I was having a little difficulty finding some of the documents on the website. Uh, yeah, the applicant an, in, in, and the the traffic consultant are here as well. I can address um, some of that. There there was a a communication that came in today that noted that in the prior traffic analysis that was done for the the project in March, there was a different. Um, background traffic condition noted than in the, the study that was done for this. And, and in this area, the, um, the Valley Transportation Authority is the designated uh, congestion management agency. They're responsible for sort of maintaining those numbers and they update them on a periodic basis. And that update occurred in between the, uh, the two reports. So the, the newer report used newer numbers um, than had been used in the previous report. So I think that's the, the, the perhaps the issue that you raised, that, that there was actually an update based on the official um, numbers that are put out by the, the congestion management agency that we're supposed to use. But if you want more depth on that, I think the, the traffic consultant would be the, the person to perhaps provide that. Yeah, because I know there was uh, some commentary about that the level of service it actually approved on the intersection from you know yeah. the baseline of what was it, 2010 or 2012. So, so perhaps maybe after the applicant speaks, the uh, hexagon can speak or something. Give us kind of a little overview of what the traffic study actually contained. Okay, I don't see any further questions, so um, I'd like to invite the applicant forward for your presentation. Good evening. Good evening. Sarah, I guess. Super. All right. Thank you. A little low tech here. Um, good evening, Mayor Gilmore and City Council. My name is Elaine Breeze with Summerhill Apartment Communities, and I appreciate the opportunity to present to you tonight our revised mixed-use senior apartment project. I am joined by our entire project team, and tonight I will review our community outreach since March 2017, design changes in response to council and community feedback, design changes as a result of changing our project to senior apartments, and finally, the project's community benefits. 
Um, in our previous application, we held three neighborhood meetings and additional meetings with the Casa Donna townhome owners next door. It was a 500 foot radius and over 200 households were invited. With the new project, we doubled that radius. Over 400 households were invited and we held two neighborhood meetings. We've also had more than 35 one-on-one -on -one meetings with community members and there are two big signs on site. And the majority liked the significant changes we had made and appreciated our responsiveness. We also gained feedback on specific design issues. And we had a lot of questions about what it meant to be a senior housing, senior apartment community. I have to admit, we were disturbed by the flyer that was distributed this weekend to the residents, not, not be, just because of its flagrant language and multiple erroneous statements, but it, it seeked to undermine the newly enhanced policy of early and substantial public outreach the city has adopted. This was the council, city council direction that we received last March from the city council. This is additional community feedback we received from the community. And our changes in response to the city council direction and community uh, feedback has been significant. First, converting the project to senior apartments. We eliminated the fifth story. We increased the commercial area. We've offered a community meeting hub to the city of Santa Clara. We added a pedestrian, public pedestrian connection, a second public plaza, we reduce the average unit size, we have more sustainability features, more transportation demand management features, and the project generates less peak traffic trips as a senior uh, mixed use senior project than the existing use. The changes in response to council and community feedback affected the entire building. This is a view from El Camino Real, and the elimination of the fifth story shown here was the most dramatic change. We maintain the full frontage retail and the public plaza on the right, and the building now steps down to three stories at Chase on the left. We participated in the community conversation around public spaces and redesigned our plaza in response to input we received as a result. I'd like to highlight a feature we maintain with the redesign that distinguishes this building from other mixed, uses, mis, mixed use projects in town. And that is, is that the residential units and massing are set back about 10 to 16 feet behind the ground floor retail here. This really resonated with residents at our community meetings. We increased the retail to be fully consistent with the general plan, adding retail along Anna Drive and El Camino, and the leasing office is not counted. It's fully parked at five spaces per thousand and designed to accommodate eight businesses versus the four to complete, uh, current. We anticipate Verizon moving back in along El Camino Real, and they have found a temporary location. And we are also pleased to inform you that we have signed an agreement with the Maori restaurant, and we will pr be providing Maori with seven months free rent starting November 1st, totaling $91,000, and providing a lease for a new 3,000 square foot corner restaurant in the new building on El Camino for up to 20 years. We're keeping a below market rate uh, rent for five for the first five years, and we've provided them with $100,000 tenant uh, improvement allowance. This is Anna Drive, and this is where the new retail is, um, and a public plaza on the right. And note that the building steps down to three stories at the Casa de Ana townhome neighbors on the left. Again, the new public plaza, and then the new pedestrian connection from Anna that leads to El Camino is on the right next to Chase. We are offering a community meeting hub. This would be offered to the city of Santa Clara it's to be used for free by the city, uh, not nonprofit groups and community groups. It would come fully furnished and amenitized and it would be managed on site. Uh, at our June neighborhood meeting, we solicited feedback and the majority of attendees preferred the hub. We are prepared to provide either though, the hub or retail. Uh, this is a concept space plan with um, seating imagery. The, pro excuse me, the project will provide neighborhood walkability and traffic flow improvements for the broader neighborhood. We're gonna interconnect the traffic signals along El Camino between Los Padres and McCormick. Um, we're adding a landscape lighted path, uh, eliminating the driveways along Anna Drive, and there will be wider sidewalk street trees and landscaping curbside on both streets. We're also providing uh, traffic calming along um, uh, Anna Drive. This is in response to neighbors' feedback. Landscape chokers along the project frontage and a new crosswalk with bulb out and choker at Anna and Block Drive. Those are off site. The project has a robust uh, transportation demand management plan 
Um, we are required to reduce vehicle miles traveled as a regional mixed use project by 20%, half of which through 10% uh, of TDMs, and that requires uh, reporting. With uh, converting the project to senior apartments, um, the daily trip generation from a regular apartment is about half. Um, and also, the AMPM trips are reduced by about 60%. Um, the project with the TDM plan is and with the monitoring is anticipated to de decrease the, both the morning trips and the PM trips, and as you can see, significantly in the PM trips um, from the existing use. Uh, we've expanded our sustainability program in response to community feedback. Um, and with all these changes, we have kept all the prior commitments we made to the immediate neighborhood, um, including the three-story height adjacent to Casa de Ana and no vehicular access onto um, Anna Drive from the project. Once we decided to pursue uh, senior housing, we commissioned a market study to determine if the site was suitable and to ensure that the new design met the seniors' needs. We hired outside counsel to make sure the project met laws regarding senior housing and we engaged a senior apartment operator to advise us as well. And, and to be clear, we are proposing a 55 plus senior apartment community. It's a lifestyle with lots of activities. It is not residential care, independent or assisted living. Uh, senior apartment rates are about 10% lower than non age restricted apartments. This is attributed, uh, attributable to a smaller market pool, lower turnover and rate elasticity. For example, Based on today's market, we anticipate a studio to be about $2,400. This is the typical resident profile. The average age is at move-in is about 70 to 71, with most residents 65 and older. The site's proximity to key services rated exceptionally. Four grocery stores, two pharmacies, retail, restaurants, and transit, all within walking distance, and the senior center is less than a mile away. Overall, the site rated at A- minus for suitability. I'd like to quickly highlight some of the physical changes we've made based on this feedback. Resident pickup zone at the lobby, we uh, stall showers in all the units, rollout bike parking, shared bikes, electric bike and scooter charging, wide sidewalks with seat walls for resting, three elevators, grab bars in all corridors. We flattened out the garage so it's easier to walk around and handicap accessible building with all units adaptable. We also uh, revised, redesigned our amenities. Uh, the pool courtyard was completely redesigned. There's a lap pool for exercise classes and a number of activities. The multi-use club room doubled in size. Um, there's more time spent at the site, more activities and things to do. Uh, the fitness studio will be able to accommodate both classes as well as age-friendly equipment. <laughs> Uh, we added raised planters for resident gardening. We added a dog run and moved the pet spa. About 60% of the residents are likely to be single women, and they uh, have a lot of dogs, from what we understand. Um, and in, uh, in summary, I, um, our changes have been significant, and they're numerous. And as proposed, our project will provide significant community benefits. It's fully consistent with the general plan the staff presented, new <coughs> senior housing, Class A commercial, uh, commercial space, fully parked. We're reducing existing traffic. We're offering a community meeting hub, outdoor public plazas, $3.2 million in park fees in addition to everything we have on site, $200,000 in offsite traffic improvements, a new uh, upgraded water main in El Camino, and $1.86 million in additional fees and improvements. And the school district will receive annually $300,000 um, as a result of the increase in the property assessment um, with no enrollment impact. Children are not allowed in this project, um, plus school fees. Um, and then the city will benefit from a more than $70 million increased uh, property assessment valuation, um, again, benefiting the city. And as we know, the city is in the middle of reviewing your affordability um, uh, uh, ordinances, and, and there might be some grandfathering, but we, we are willing to be a part of that discussion, and we are voluntarily offering five uh, moderate income units tonight as well. Um, and in conclusion, we are very excited to be bringing uh, a new active senior housing community for the city of Santa Clara. Our project will offer active seniors a safe and secure living environment, one with excellent walkability to desirable retail and services, 
with professionally managed programs for an engaging senior lifestyle. I thank you and I'm available for any questions. Yes, for questions, uh, Vice Mayor Caserta. Thank you for your presentation. Um, a, a few questions. Um, the community hub, is that part of the roughly 18,000 square feet retail? That's correct. Okay. And can you talk about that a little more? Let's say a community uh, group wants to um, caucus or gather there. Can you talk about that procedure? So we would, um, as I mentioned, we would manage that reservation program. So there's on-site uh, leasing staff and management. Um, they would be trained to take reservations. I would guess we would get into some software type program that makes it easy. Um, and they would sign up in advance. Uh, we have in the uh, packet um, some sort of best practices of uh, wanting people to have enough notice. And, and so we would manage that whole process, the reservation process. And, and, and two of the free. existing people in that area have committed to uh, being located in that retail space? That's correct. And you, you mentioned um, 3,000 square foot. You envision that as, as a one restaurant, or can you tease that out a little with your consultants and projections on there? Sure. So the, um, the Maori will have 3,000 feet to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, that, that we anticipate to be on the right side of the um, corner, of, uh, so adjacent to Chase. And then we've designed a second restaurant um, with outdoor seating on the public plaza corner. And then um, we can accommodate, uh, infrastructure-wise, a third um, restaurant in the middle of, that, of the El Camino frontage. The, um, the 300000 annually to the school district, that's in perpetuity? Yeah, that would be an annual. That's basically the benefit of the increased property value of the project. A um, few more questions. I'm curious on the 35 one-to-one -one meetings that you had. Um, what were the genesis of those? Was it anyone that wanted to talk with you, basically? Um, yes, and some people that maybe didn't want to talk with us. So we, we really were reached out to people that had asked questions, um, that maybe were, uh, had concerns at the last hearing. Um, so it was, it was reaching out to a lot of uh, different people that um, had expressed concerns the last round. Can you talk about the epistemology or the way that you came up with um, your idea that there will be less um, traffic during work time and not time. Um, I, I've, I've got some emails about that. Can, can you tease that out a little for me? Sure, and, um, and the, I, I would probably prefer the traffic consultant to okay. do that, um, just because they, they can speak to that. I mean, I, I'm happy to, but it'd be more official if you. Okay, um, I appreciate it, thank you. Um, before the traffic consultant comes up, I have other questions, Councilmember Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you for the presentation, Ms. Breeze. Um, I just want to go back to a uh, statement that you made about the five moderate uh, income units. Where do you anticipate, uh, or what size units do you anticipate those being? Do you, do you we we could do those mind? proportionally to the building. Mm -hmm. So, and better said, I guess um, we would, if, if um, let's say there's... Uh, certain percentage of one bedrooms, we would apply that to the same. I haven't done the math myself, but my guess it would be like one studio, three one bedrooms and one two bedroom, just kind of thinking about it. But. Okay. Um, the, the reason I, I bring it up is um, it's a wonderful project and thank you for all of the you know changes that have been made. Um, but the one thing that I hadn't heard uh, mentioned was a, about affordable housing. And as we've, you know, wanting to build projects, we want to bring in, we want to make sure that a certain percentage, you know, whether it be 10 or 15 percent of those units uh, be saved for affordable housing. And because we don't want to set a precedent going forward, uh, we want to make sure that we set aside um, uh, units, you know, to you know, be able to offer them to people that need affordable housing. There's a, a big need for that, and especially, you know, in the senior community. Um, so uh, I was very curious about that. Do you, do you have any idea, um, I mean, five, five moderate income units, is it possible to add to that as a result of... With it, we've addressed all these comments, as you can imagine. Well, with that addressing, 
um, we lost the whole fifth floor. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the, uh, with the revenue for the fifth floor, fourth, fifth floor. Um, and then, as I mentioned, senior apartments are going to rent for 10% 10 per, 10 less generally. So we've lost that as well. Um, so with all the, and, and then on top of that, we've actually um, increased costs uh, with the changes that we've made. Obviously, the redesign, but then just adding these other things. So um, th that's that's where I where, where we are. Um. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor Caserta. You have more questions. Uh, any other questions? I think the traffic engineer. There was some questions from a couple council members. Thank you, sir. I think uh, good you may evening. have heard a couple of the questions. Uh, Gary Black with Hexagon Transportation Consultants. We did the traffic study for the project. And one of the questions I heard was, um, how do we figure out uh, the estimate that this project would actually result in reduced traffic compared to the existing development on the site? Um, so there's two components. One is the existing traffic generation on the site, and the other is the projected traffic generation from this project. So to determine the uh, traffic generation on the site, we counted all the uh, site driveways during, um, during peak times. And uh, as I understand, more recently, some of the sites have gone, or some of the storefronts have gone vacant, but we did this when everything was fully occupied. And then we project the traffic from the project based on our standard reference sources that we look at that um, are based on studying other senior apartment projects are, um, kind of around the country, around the area and around the country, that shows us, gives us an estimate of how many trips will be generated by uh, a senior apartment complex like this, and also the retail as well. That's part of the, that's part of the trip generation component. And so we just simply compare those two. And that was the, um, uh, that's what, where we came up with the, with the numbers about the reduced traffic, especially in the afternoon um, when some of those, stores are, are busier. And of course, senior apartments generate a lot less traffic than market rate apartments, because uh, people are, tend to be more of retirement age. Um, I think there was another question that Mr. Crabtree did address, which was about, I think there was some communication that was received today questioning um, kind of the difference between the old study, I'll, I'll call it the old study and the new study. Uh, the old study was of the original project, which was market rate apartments, and that study was done. Um, there was a, as Mr. Crabtree explained, there was a change in the input data that we get from the um, uh, from the VTA, Valley Transportation Authority. Um, they updated their baseline data in the time period from the earlier study to the present study. So because they updated their baseline data, we wanted to capture the latest data. And so we did do that update for this, for this particular version of the study. So it does differ from the earlier version. Councilmember Neal, you have a question? So, yeah. So thank you. So uh, kind of continuing on that, um, you know, the. Uh, some of the changes. So, you know, we, we got, you know, a copy of the chart comparing things and, and most like with a level of service, which I know we're not even really supposed to be looking at that so much anymore, but um, <laughs> it looked like things were pretty consistent, which I think you know, people are like, have a hard time looking at some of the couple of the intersections, El Camino Scott, that in 2012, it looked like some, uh, AM and PM, we had like level, you know, D. And then only one of the, like, it is, so the, um, then looking at the updated um, for the AMs, it improved to C. And so is that based on the change data set? Because one of these was 2016, one was 2017. So I think a lot, you know, some people looked at that and said, how can you say that, you well, know, the, yeah. uh, the, you know, that it was really one step better? Well, that, well um, to say it's one whole step better was, would not not be correct because there's a dividing line, and it's just it's just a couple it's, seconds. Yeah, it's just a couple seconds, and so it's just right now. If you compare the new one to the old one, it's almost a D, 
It's right at the edge. So there, the difference is not that great. It's just that there, you have to draw a line, and once you go over the yeah. line, you, you enter into the other category. But these are data that we're required to use. Um, they're, they're provided to us. And so we need to be consistent. Right, so that, so that all the jurisdictions are using similar data and so that we're looking at um, using the same, you know, so to treat different projects in a similar manner in terms of doing the analysis on the, in the traffic. That's correct. Okay, so it, um, it, do you yourself, I know you mentioned, you know, it, it, it kind of seems to make sense that there would be less trips if it was senior apartments, I mean, do you have any personal experience with having looked at, like, you know, actually having analyzed some senior projects in our area? Uh, yes, there we are have. some other ones. Yeah, we have, and, and and we do find the same trend that the senior um, complexes uh, generate a lot less traffic than non-age restricted apartments. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all I have for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Um, next, I have, is, is, does staff have anything before we go to the public? Okay. I have some cards here, and I'm sure there's some people would like to speak. Uh, first, we have Cynthia Owens, and then uh, it looks like Kathy Betts on, on deck. Good evening, Cynthia. Good evening. Thank you, council and staff. Um, most of you know me for my involvement on another important project I've been involved with for the past 10 years. But most of you may not know that I'm also involved in other community work. One of the hats I wear is that of a neighborhood crime watch captain uh, of one of, if not the largest neighborhood crime watch in Santa Clara. It's over 100 homes, and I started about 25 years ago. We have a wonderful, close-knit community, um, and I'm very good friends with several original owners who have lived there since the 60s and the 70s. We do neighborhood block parties, national night out, and all of that. One of the hardest things about this job is when my friends and neighbors reach a phase in their lives when they no longer want the challenges of keeping up a big house, and they look for senior housing and retirement communities. What is sad is that over the past 40 years, our neighbors that have relocated have all had to move out of our city looking for a housing development similar to what we're looking at tonight. Uh, this hit home again with me several years ago when my dad was ready to downsize. My sisters and I looked everywhere for an active retirement community for him to move to, and we had to move him out of Santa Clara also. Uh, we chose the Belmont Village over by Santana Row for a lot of the same reasons this new project will bring to Santa Clara. I would have loved to have dad stay in Santa Clara. Um, so I'm really excited about this senior housing. I, the seniors are near and dear to my heart. They offer so much. Um, I love that the housing is in Santa Clara, that it's close to amenities. Its walkability is a wonderful factor. And it's good for our seniors, for our city, and for our families. And I hope you approve it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Betts and then Nathan Ho on deck, please. Good evening. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council Members, City Manager, and Staff. My name is Kathy Betts, and I have worked in the senior housing field for the past 37 years, specifically Liberty Tower in Santa Clara. I would like to express my support for the senior housing mixed-use proposal on El Camino Real. I am so encouraged that the city is considering expanding the stock of senior housing in Santa Clara. With the age demographic growing every year, the urgency for the full complement of senior housing is evident. The design, location, and livability of this community will benefit its occupants, the neighbors, and the city of Santa Clara. I believe the quality of housing and retail components, along with the responsiveness of its developer, will serve the city housing goals and provide a beautiful, vibrant setting for aging Santa Clarence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nathan Ho and then Priscilla Haynes on deck. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Mayor Gilmore, Council. Uh, thank you. My name is Nathan Ho. I'm the Senior Director of Housing Community Development for the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Uh, leadership Group represents more than 375 of Silicon Valley's most respected employers uh, on issues that affect economic health and quality 
of life in the Silicon Valley, including housing. Uh, leadership group uh, and the housing committee endorsed uh, the 2232 2240 El Camino Real mixed use senior community development. Uh, we are excited by the proposed senior community and ret retail space and the vision for a vibrant, walkable El Camino Real uh, community that complements the adjacent uh, Santa Clara Town Center um, and is in line with the general plan. Uh, Summer Hill's propo proposal has the opportunity to stand as a great example of appropriate density uh, along the transit rich El Camino Real. Uh, its public plazas and wide sidewalks can activate the ground floor level along El Camino Real and Anna Drive. Um, we commend the developer for being thoughtful in the proposal and for taking into account community and council input in the revised design. Uh, the immediate proximity to the town center, including restaurants uh, and the amenities the developer has proposed, uh, would be beneficial to senior residents and allowing them to age gracefully in place. Um, on a personal note, Santa Clara Town Center is where uh, my family and I uh, go to dine and shop. Uh, I have two young children, um, and it's where we, they're two and three, um, and it's where we go uh, to get their energy out before nap. Um, and so we look forward to- Good to know, what time are you there so we can avoid you? <laughs> yes, yeah. right before 12 o'clock, um, the, uh, the planters in front of Sprouts. Oh uh, that's, yeah. That's, that's where we are. Um, and so we look forward to walking the kids over to this new uh, development. Uh, we are very pleased to see the uh, two public plazas are now part of the uh, design of this uh, new community. Um, and we'll have the kids run around there too. Thank you. Thanks, keep them running. Yes. Okay, Priscilla. Haynes, please come forward, and then Kurt Vartan, you're on deck. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I'm Priscilla Haynes. I'm the Executive Director of Santa Clara Methodist Retirement Foundation, uh, which comprises of Liberty Tower here in Santa Clara and Wesley Manor in Campbell, California. And I have been building um, affordable housing for the last 30 years. And I look at this project as a beautiful best practice of what future projects should be the walkability, the age friendly is which Santa Clara has adopted. Um, it'll be a great asset for seniors to be able to live in the community and be able to age in place. And also good socialization, because you got a lot of things going on, which is really great. I just want to add that um, every second someone turns 65, every second. And in 2018, we'll have 40 million 65-year-olds. And it continues to grow from there. Um, even though we're supporting of affordable senior housing, but it's just not all. It's the whole gamut, I mean, from market rate to affordable and all. And we have to also plan for those things. And one of the big things three things that is on the agenda that's a big trend for aging in the community right now is of course the healthcare landscape and what we're all gonna do about that. Two is what is trending in the best practices and, that, and what that may look like, what that would be for the technological side for seniors and what's happening in the housing and new developments and what's for the future as, as in the age-friendly cities. Um, and number three is positioning to win. And with that, what should you be doing now? And I think this type of project is something that you should be doing now. It's a winning project for the city of Santa Clara. And just my last comment is winners will focus on winning and losers will focus on the winners and wonder how did they do that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kurt Vartan and then Michael Say. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, through the uh, wisdom and discussion of um, Don Whedon, we know that over the next 13 years now, that Santa Clara County will be growing by roughly 300,000 residents. Of those 300,000, about 65% of them will be over 65. That's a whole lot of seniors that we're gonna have in our community here. Um, they'll, some will be well off, some will be very well off. Some will not be, and some will be struggling, and some will be wanting to move out of their uh, single family homes and maybe not having to maintain a multi-level place, a multi-room place, and some place that they can just call, something that they can enjoy and not have to worry about the amenities around them. So I would ask that you support this project 
um, but with the caveat of, or with the additional requirement of higher density. We talk about you know, affordability, as Councilmember Watanabe spoke of. How can we get more affordability? Well, you get more affordability by having more units and by allowing more units, but unfortunately, this council required them to knock off a floor. If you want more affordability, put on a floor, put on two floors, ask them to do more. So more density would be my first request. My second request is to continue to enhance the transit options, which they've seemed to have done, and uh, I applaud them for that. Uh, but the most important thing that I would ask is unbundling all parking. Uh, it was asked, what happens if we don't have enough parking? Well, I would ask, what happens if we have too much parking? We've already invested over $50,000 or $45,000 of space in a parking garage. That's millions of dollars in potentially unused spaces, especially for seniors. So I would ask, how can we right size the parking and not overbuild that and burden the development with that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, come forward, and then uh, Sean O'Carroll on deck. Welcome. Oh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Michael Tai. I'm the founder of South Bay YMV, which stands for Yes in My Backyard. Um, I'm actually on this month's episode of Valley Politics with my friend uh, Alex Shore of Catalyze SV, who I'm sure you'll be hearing from as well. Anyways, I'm here to speak in support of this project. I've been working and uh, meeting with these developers over several months and watching how this project has evolved uh, over the course of time. And I'm pleased with the direction it's taken. As others before have commented, there is a growing need for senior housing and providing more, more options for seniors, many of whom feel stuck in single family homes and having difficulty downsizing. So I think this is a step in the right direction. Uh, I think it also stands in good contrast to the proposed uh, senior housing in San Jose, which I don't believe is gonna be really affordable or uh, a good use for the region. Uh, one thing I'm especially pleased by with this project is their effort to help onboard new residents with uh, public transit, which I think will be sorely needed as we build more density along El Camino Real. As a region, Silicon Valley is really facing a severe housing crunch and it's not just a Santa Clara issue. I believe building more housing in Santa Clara is gonna help relieve the pressure across multiple cities and relieve congestion. It's a great location by building next to all this uh, retail and commercial space so that people can walk instead of drive to their destinations. So against all those arguments that this is gonna increase traffic, I feel like promoting walkability is gonna decrease traffic and be good for the environment. I know I've engaged uh, with some of you, uh, including uh, Council Member Watanabe, and I'd be happy to engage with more of you as well as uh, we look at this project and future projects down the road. I believe we should all come together to make Santa Clara and the surrounding region a better place for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I like your shirt. All right, um, Sean O'Carroll, and then Jason Yulencott. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Good Welcome. Evening. Well, uh, thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Sean O'Carroll. I was raised in Santa Clara. I work for Cornish and Carey Commercial in Santa Clara currently as a retail broker. Um, I want to speak to the retail portion, and uh, I, I represent Verizon Wireless Corporate. Uh, that's a corporate store that's in an old Wendy's, as you probably know, or maybe you don't know. Um, Summerhill's been very, and their brokers have been very upfront with Verizon as far as planning on when uh, the building was going to come down, hopefully, and what the new project would look like. Uh, one of my assignments was to try to find a temporary location for Verizon. They wanted to stay in Santa Clara, and it was much more difficult than you would think. They, retailers today have so much, uh, so many, there's not that many of them, non-food retailers looking for space, and they're very particular in where they go, wanting to be next to a daily needs generator like a Sprouts or a Target, which is where, where Verizon's located now. So we were able to secure a space in Santa Clara down near Petco on a, uh, you know, a, a deal a term long enough that Verizon can stay in Santa Clara with the hope of coming back into this project. Um, the developer has been very upfront with, or spoke to Verizon and the brokers as far as 
how the space lays out, what it looks like. I mean, I love that the fact that the residential is set back behind the retail, as far as signage, parking, meets all the criteria to attract good retail to Santa Clara. Even though it's not part of uh, the town center, I think it really does feed off of that. You're gonna attract a good retail group there. So um, I just ask you to support the project. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Jason and then uh, Paul Bickmore, welcome. Good evening. I support this project. It's an opportunity to provide 151 desperately needed housing units. I agree with the earlier comments that it would be even better if it had more units and if it had unbundled parking, but that said, there are several things I really like about it. It's a two minute walk from a, from a rapid bus stop. It's within walking distance of two grocery stores and two pharmacies. So this is a great opportunity to give, give people a place to live without increasing traffic and to let seniors retain their mobility if they choose not to drive or are unable to drive. I know that the enormity of the housing crisis can seem overwhelming at times, but I just want to remind everyone that this is not abstract. By approving this project, we'll be giving 151 real people a chance to stay in the Bay Area and not be separated from their family and their social support networks when they otherwise might be displaced. So I urge the council to approve the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Bickmore and then Adina Levine. Good evening. Hi. Um, this project is on a transit corridor, it's on a small block, and it's surrounded by uh, retail, particularly grocery stores. Um, this is, um, I've spoken in favor of the earlier versions of this project and uh, urge you to support this uh, new one uh, as we need all the housing we can get. Um, um, I think some of the objections to projects like these involve things like height and traffic, but um, Tall buildings, especially when they're integrated with the sidewalk on the ground floor, are a good thing. I like tall buildings, um, especially in, in forming a, um, a street wall in a, along um, El Camino Real. Uh, second, um, the metric that is being used to determine traffic congestion is LOS. Level of service tends to overestimate traffic problems and is often used to justify, um, you know, separated grade interchanges and blowing out curbs and widening streets. If they're predicting lower LOS, this is great. Um, so uh, I don't like all of it. Uh, I prefer unbundled parking. Um, that too much um, minimum parking requirements penalizes people like me who get around mostly by bike um, and or transit. Um, and I would like to see, um, you know, we could have, I'd like to echo some of the early comments that uh, we could have more affordable housing if um, we had more density, but um, we need all the housing we can get and you should support this, thank you. Thank you for your comments, Adina. And then Scott Lane after that. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members and staff, Adina Levin with Friends of Caltrain, um, supporting sustainable transportation on the Peninsula Corridor on our transit corridors, Caltrina and El Camino Real, and therefore uh, here supporting this uh, project um, with senior housing on the transit corridor uh, right near the rapid bus stop and uh, uh, not that far from the train station. Also, good location, walking distance from the stores as several people have mentioned. Um, I'd like to mention a couple of points um, building on what some others have said regarding the transportation demand management and the parking. First of all, really glad to see the reporting on the parking, how much is used. Um, so based on information from Transform Green Trip, as well as from the developer, um, about one um, space per unit is probably what's likely to be needed based on that data. And I understand that people are nervous, but having that data going forward will provide you the information for future projects to be able to alleviate that fear if it turns out that yes, the transform and the developer data are correct, future you can right size the parking. Um, point number two regarding the transportation demand management, um, I see that there are six months of transit passes provided. Um, when parking spaces are provided, they're provided in perpetuity. Transforms green trip um, gold standard um, to approve a, a, a project, certify a project is um, for 40 years. And since that is a 
um, something that developer might need to do if they don't meet their goal, we know that they can afford to do it. So that's something they can do. And I would urge you to ask for those 40 years of transit passes. We don't give away a parking space and then take it back in six months and the uh, transit benefits should be there long term also. And um, for the un unbundled parking, glad to see one, would love to see more in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Scott Lane. And then Michael Healy on deck. Always a pleasure to follow Dina. Hi, Scott Lane. Um, this is frankly a very unique. Michelle, sorry, I have to say Michelle because I keep saying Michael. I apologize. No, no, no go ahead. No, no go ahead. Go, Can you start him over? I'm sorry. I, I told her I'd never do that again, and I just did it. So sorry, Michelle. Anyways, I'm sorry, Scott. <laughs> go ahead. Ooh, rewind. Um, this is a unique footprint. I mean, basically to the south and to the east. It's a much different footprint. You can actually go taller. I know a lot of people don't like tall. You lopped off the fifth floor. Okay, you want affordable housing. Okay, we just got rid of the chance for affordable housing by lopping off the fifth floor, let's be honest. This is an opportunity, if you, even if you keep it up four floors, you can actually build another floor or two or three up where the parking garage is only. Let's think differently about this. Let's think about an age-friendly city. We'll make this an age-friendly city. Make this an age-friendly development. House building, not cars, is, is a group that I belong to. $90,000 per parking spot is what Palo Alto is, is cost for their parking garages. We could do something innovative. Go down, before and after the garage. You could put something in. What would be nice in Santa Clara? I don't know, how about four to six bowling lanes? How about a speakeasy? How about a pub? People that are elderly and aged, or you have this image. No, they're vibrant, they're alive. This is what this development is about, making it vibrant and alive. If we can pe keep people vibrant and alive, they won't get unhealthy. That's just the bottom line. So look at what we're doing as a holistic picture. What, what I hope is there would be some people that could be caregivers on site. You could understand that this is the best development on Santa Clara, probably in five or 10 years, the closest to satisfying the Grand Boulevard initiatives, the closest to actually listening to the people. But the problem is the people with the squeaky wheel that keep calling a five-story building a high-rise, which it is not, is insane. We need the city council to give direction to the planning commission and others that in where we can have the space where you have shadows that it's not going to cast a big area, you can do this. You've made Summerhill sacrifice a lot and they Thank shouldn't you, have had to do all they did. Michelle Healy and then <laughs> Anil Barbar. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I know I haven't been here in a while, so you're not used to me I know, that's, anymore. that was it, yeah, that's it. <laughs> the Santa Clara School District has met a few times with Summerhill, and with this project, uh, we were hoping that they would offer us double the statutory fees that they had offered us with the original design that they had when they were doing the purely uh, non-senior housing. <coughs> this project has us concerned because the development has changed into senior housing. And as those seniors move out of their larger homes that has been commented on earlier today, they're moving into smaller apartments that they can take care of more easily. That means that more resident, more families will be moving in to where those people are living now. And we will get no money for development of new classrooms for any of the families that may be moving into any of the homes that these seniors will be moving out of in order to go into these apartments. The $300,000 that they did comment on will be going to the general fund, and that's our normal revenue um, that we get for basic aid. So that goes to teacher salaries and administration and textbooks. That does not go to actual construction of the classrooms. So we know that you are going to be making a decision, and overall it is very positive in the room tonight, which is nice to hear, but we did wish that Summerhill would come through as they had with their previous development and support the district so that it can be a stronger community overall. Thank you. Thank you. Anil? And then Sriram Palapudi. Welcome. 
Hi, Mayor. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor Gilmore and Council. Uh, my name is Anil Babar, Vice President of Public Affairs for the California Apartment Association. Um, I'm here today to speak on behalf of the project in question and in support of it. Um, as you all know and should come to as no surprise, we're in a housing crisis and adding supply is the number one way of helping to alleviate the uh, problem. Uh, Santa Clara is one of the more affordable cities in the Bay Area and that's because of your um, positive uh, response to adding more housing when, when possible. Um, this project in particular is something we're very uh, excited about. It adds uh, to the senior component, which is generally overlooked um, as a target. It allows the residents in the city to age in place. Um, it provides a number of benefits that I'm not gonna go into detail on because it's been said. So I will close by saying we encourage you to support this project and um, uh, we look forward to seeing it being built. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sri Rem. And then Alex Shore. Good evening. Welcome. So I, I understand with the changing times, the city has to change, more people coming, more things have to happen. What I don't understand is we're taking about 115,000 square feet of land with more people coming in, we need more space for entertainment and other business commercial activities. And we've decided to just take away 115,000 and substitute it with less than about 15,000 feet of commercial. I just don't get how that's going to help. People, are keep, people keep saying that this is senior and it's good and all that. Just realize that it's only 10% less than market rates. She said 2,400 bucks for a studio, it's 2,200. A one bedroom is going to be 2,800, 2,400, and a two bedroom probably is going to be more than 3,000 bucks. There's a lot of other, if that's the definition of affordable, the city already has a lot. We need to focus on making it, somebody said holistic, which is what we have to keep in mind. We have to, when we build something up, down, it doesn't matter. We have to make sure we have equivalent space for all the other auxiliary activities that human beings want to do, not just live inside their apartment and that's it. It's just, it boggles the mind that we are going down from a commercially zoned area of 120,000 to less than 20,000. Some, I commend the Summerhill project for doing what they're doing and for being ready to compromise, but as a council and as a planning commission, we really have to be more creative and make sure that when the number of people grow with the density, we have to make sure there are other entertainment options available. Otherwise, we'll end up having to commute for every single thing to the neighboring cities of Cupertino, Mountain View, and whatnot. Just keep that in mind and always push for a little more balance in commercial versus residential. Not saying that we should not increase our housing, we should, but we should always keep this balance in mind. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Alex, sure, and then Kevin Ward. Good evening. Good evening, Council. My name is Alex Shore. I'm a uh, with Catalyze SV, we're a community group in Santa Clara and parts of San Jose. I've been here before you a couple times to advocate for Core Company's Agrihood project. And since then, of course, our housing crisis has gotten much, much worse. If you read the Mercury News this week, you read that thousands of jobs in the last two months have left our valley. If you read what the experts said as to why, that was because we do not have enough housing in this valley. That threat is very, very real, and it will unfortunately become a reality if we don't build more units. We've been talking with this developer for many, many months, urging them to do things like increase the number of units, despite the decision at the last council meeting, to unbundle the parking and to enhance the ability of its residents and its visitors to use public transit and other means, modes of transportation besides the individually owned automobile. You have the power tonight to make this project even better than it already is. We are very pleased with things like community rooms that have been added on to the project, that it is mixed use. We really like the senior component for folks who wanna live in this valley and stay here. And we think you from the dais tonight can make this project even better, again, by unbundling parking, by creating more units to address this crisis because the plan allows it and you are allowed to it and you can clearly see here tonight there is support for doing so and you will have backing from all the people who came out, Catalyze SV leaders and otherwise for you if you do that tonight and we think this is the way to go. We just don't know what the transportation landscape looks like 
In a couple years, we may be owning fewer cars. We may have autonomous vehicles. We may have better transit. We may have Lyft and Uber be more ubiquitous than they are now. And we need those solutions to be accommodated for and accounted for as you make decision. We don't need more parking in this county. We need more housing. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Kevin Ward and then Emily Macroot. Good evening. Good evening, worthy councilman. My name is Kevin Ward. I've been a resident of Santa Clara for more than 20 years. I cannot imagine how you could conclude that the cur current analyses include a non-senior housing scenario. And further, I cannot imagine how you conclude, conclude that the current analyses include data for the category of 55 and under. Why? Because the analyses do not assess for 55 and under. While no federal or state housing laws require anyone to rent to older persons, these housing laws permit housing discrimination under narrow circumstances, including when 80% of housing units include at least one person age 55 and or over. The law uh, allows property owners to rent 20% of their units to college fraternity, brothers, and sorority sisters, and still claim that their property is senior housing. Further, those cited laws allow 100% of the units to have residents of all ages, including children, teens, young adults, and other tenants, as long as each unit has at least one person who is at least 55 years old. They chose rental flexibility. This means under the application tonight, you could have a grandma from India, her adult child, her child's adult spouse, and two grandchildren all living together. You cannot certify the envir environmental assessments tonight because the assessments did not account for this scenario. Yet you all know that this scenario absolutely will still occur because Summerhill has designed the project explicitly so it can occur. So would you certify the environmental assets for this project as if it was pre presented as a rent to anyone project? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emily Macru and then Herbir Bhatia. Good evening. Good evening, City Council members. My name is Emily McCrott. I've been living in Santa Clara for the last 20 years. I'm in it, I've been teaching for 20 years, and I <clears throat> can't look to seeing, living in a senior citizen home for $2,400 a month. I won't be able to afford that. So I don't see how is it, how is it so affordable for people. Maybe it's for the rich seniors of Santa Clara. Anyway, when is a senior home project not a senior project? Though city staff members would like you to believe differently, the proposal before you has no guarantees that it will ever be a senior housing project, much less to stay a housing project in the future. Summerhill cites federal law and state laws, but guess what? Those cited laws actually say. Those laws explicitly provide that any residential property owner may rent to anyone regardless of age or ethnicity or gender. This is not only a senior housing project, it isn't an affordable senior project. Though some personal friends of Summerhill consultants have written letters at Summerhill's request to support this project, this is not a project that will inspire local property owners to sell their homes and become renters. And these are not community acti activity activists all excited about this project. The letters were written to, at, at the developer's request, not because the community is begging for the project. If one sells one's home for 750, 100,000, then rents for 20 years, one will have donated 100% of one's home to Summerhill for 20 years, and next stop will be homelessness because of all housing assets would be gone. Think this through, are you going to sell your home and spend it on, all on rent? Council members, I ask you tonight to ponder a single question. Would you certify the environmental assessments of this project? It was presented to you not as a senior project, but as a rent to anyone project. 
They want calculation bonus for a project and not guarantee to stay seniors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. And then Adam Thompson. Good evening. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good to see you again. Um, <clears throat> A couple of things. I, I think we all know that the question about uh, need for housing is there or not. I think we all agree that there is a need for housing. So there's no question about that, and I don't want to reiterate that. I love that Summer Hill is thinking about our seniors. Uh, we're all going there very quickly, and we're going to be living longer. Um, and there's enough stats to confirm through Don Whedon and everybody else and our own mothers and grandmothers that the numbers are increasing. But having said that, there are a couple of things in here that really bring some concern. One is, how do we guarantee that this will stay senior housing? We don't have regulation that I understand as a city to over provide oversight and management of that. And secondly, affordability. I think enough people have given that feedback. I mean, can people afford to live with that at a pension or even a, a salary that is of a person who's coming out of work after 20 years? I don't think so. So I think that's an issue. And three, how are we assess addressing the needs of the displaced retailers? Right now, we've already had one bike shop closed down, not because necessarily they wanted to or not, I don't know that. But the fact is Mayuri is one of the largest restaurants with that kind of space, and we have such a shortage of retail space and banquet space, that they're always busy. There's almost 8,000 square feet. So those are the three things that really come to mind. So having said that, my uh, question, or I guess comment, is when we make that decision, we need to ask how do we regulate? How do we manage this? If for example, they're not able to fill every room or apartment or unit with seniors at a particular market rate. What's our guidance as a council? What is our guidance as a city? I think we need to think that through and provide that guidance when we make this decision. Number two, the retail space of 24,000 feet today is being lessened to less than 15,000. How are we going to address that? Because that is only for about 10 units, 10 different businesses, when four units right now cannot be squeeze into 10 units because they're 1,000 square foot each. And finally, we need more affordable housing. In closing, I am supporting that we need to have more housing of this nature, but we do need to think this through. It cannot be just a simple, yes, we approve. There has to be some follow-up actions and processes in place. Thank you. Thank you. Adam? And then I don't have any other cards, so if anyone would like to speak, you can please queue up. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'd like to speak in support of this project. Uh, I, I was here in March when it was originally proposed and was actually opposed to it at that point. Um, I think they have been a very good corporate citizen in reaching out. I went to the both meetings that they had. They were listened and they actually took those uh, suggestions and comments from the public and actually worked with that in their new plan. Um, the meeting room was a personal request of, of mine. I think it's really great. I think a lot of people find themselves um, meeting down there at Pete's Coffee, and we have a hard time finding meeting places for uh, the community members, and I think that was a really good thing to offer up to the community. Um, I would like to see more, you know, always more affordable housing, but with the fifth floor getting knocked out, I definitely understand why the limitations come. I mean, they've they made some pretty big concessions to make that happen. Um, this is a great location for senior housing. The walkability, the amenities that are close by um, definitely benefit um, somebody who potentially won't need to use a vehicle. I know my grandmother who lived in, in Sunnyvale until she was 92 years old had a hard time getting around. She wouldn't drive at night, um, even, in the, even in the evenings, and she was isolated once my, uh, my grandfather passed away. So to be in a community with more um, people in that life situation and being able to get out and walk to those amenities and go to coffee and go to some restaurants, I think will be very beneficial to community members um, of the seniors. I do understand where some people say $2,400 is a lot of money, but it might not be for everybody. Certain seniors are going to want to downsize. I mean, they also have hopefully an opportunity to rent their home to offset that cost. I mean, so with that aside, I do think this is a very good project for the city. It's probably the best one I've seen on the El Camino Real um, for a long time, and I would just like to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Come forward, state your name, please. Nick Caspar, Santa Clara Chamber of Commerce. 
Um, I'm happy to say that um, I represent the chamber when I say that we fully support this project. Um, I think it's really great, it's, and I really want to say thank you to Summerhill for their outreach to the public and the fact that they made so many changes um, with using the public's outreach in this. Um, the walkability and the available public spaces in this really makes it an example of a sustainable living space for Santa Clara. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Councilman. Um, my name is Joe Szynski. I'm representing the Santa Clara Chamber of Commerce Convention Center and Visitors Bureau. As the chairman of the board, I also am a 20 plus year resident and own a small business in Santa Clara and live less than a mile from where this is going in. I fully support this because I may be living there someday. <laughs> and, uh, it's not good for the community, good for our schools, it's good for our businesses. So I recommend that the, that the council fully support this project and what a great partner with Summerhill. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, I live in the fallout area of this, uh, this building. Uh, and I, uh, I have some concerns about the, uh, the, the fundamental cost structure for, for the housing of the, of the uh, seniors. It's already been mentioned several times uh, about the cost of, uh, of a studio of $2,400. I visit the, the homeless. I visit the, the elderly that are in the homes uh, in, the, in the area. And quite frankly, uh, they don't have the kind of money to, to, to rent this kind of a, a facility. Um, I think the basis of, of this structure is, needs to be rethought. And, and uh, we do need more, more homes in the area, uh, but they've got to be affordable. This is not affordable. This is more of a, a financial uh, money-making project. And I'm deeply concerned that uh, we, we need to re-look re at this more closely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. Evening, Karen Hardy. Um, my concern is what we had there not what we have even. We had four viable businesses. One said they're having trouble moving. That's a national business and not worried about um, perishable type items. One is, was bought out for over a million dollars out of their lease. One closed their doors. We lost the bicycle shop. My concern is we're down to a restaurant that is viable. And I feel like the city council has a moral obligation to first do no harm. I see very little in here to help a small business and businessman who will have his business closed down for 18 months. That is the time they're saying for construction. They're talking about a few months partial rent all those people who will lose their jobs during that time. And when you talk about a community room, there already is a community room there that's not charged for or an extra space. And it's used as a community room. And it's, and it's uh, used a lot, I should say. I see many parties, activities, and things going on there. I think the city council has a moral obligation to first do no harm to those businesses that are here and see what we can do to help them rather than being forced to sign a contract or a binding agreement that is not in their best interest. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good evening. Good evening. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, I'm here, I'm Raj Chahal here as a resident, not as a planning commissioner. Now, this one is a very good project, but the location is not the right location. Scott, El Camino, and St. Thomas is one of the worst corridors of traffic. St. Thomas has all F rating. Scott is almost there. And I'm the one who sent all those traffic data to you. And if you look at the traffic data, 2012, 
loss of uh, level of service on Scott and El Camino was D. And our traffic has increased by more than 20 to 30 percent since 2012 and 2017. And our level of service is now C. I can't explain that any resident can see that level of service has gone down tremendously. The hexagon study, which I heard some comments from Mr. Andrew and hexagon representative, that the VTA data came after that. Both these studies on the very first page, they mentioned that the data collected were based on May 2016, which is the data which have to be, have to adhere to. And if we compare that data, there was a manipulation of the data. 200 trips were reduced going southbound on Scott on PM, 200. And then the projected background and the project data, again, 199 trips were eliminated. If you have seen this CEQA documents, I have not seen that VTA document anywhere which supports this talk. I will be happy to go through those documents and see where this data is coming from. And one of the biggest issues for quality of life of residents right now is traffic. And if we have we based our decision based on such traffic numbers, which I think are manipulated, unless otherwise I'm being supported by the documents, it's not good for the residents. And there is no affordability component on it, but anywhere else, this is a good um, pro you. project, but not in this location. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I was here on April 18th. I remember a couple of days. I remember the end. I stopped by Lotus Fountain and stopped here. And three months later, last time before was, I think, July 18th. And since then, I was poisoned. Just before I talk, I'm just telling you, just to tell you where I'm coming from. I lost over 50 pounds. I barely could fit 30 ways. I, I wore 33. Oh, are you kidding? Yeah. They tried to poison me, but they can't kill me. It's the irony. I drank Chernobyl. They think I'm thinking it's the Russians. No, it's their own guys. It is. And today, you know what tomorrow is? Anniversary of Payne Stewart. Guess what? The same guys fixed his plane as John Jr. Yeah, they both were murdered. Yeah. And the FBI, they know I know. I know this stuff. They both were murdered Yeah, on 99. It's a true story because he was going to be a gorgeous running mate. It was a lock. Matthew, come on. I'm, a, I'm an independent, okay? Okay, now with this project, you guys, you know, this is totally wrong. It doesn't fit. You guys, like 25, 25, there's not even enough spaces. Look, these guys are always talk. Most of the seniors already have housing. We don't even need a senior house. Okay, we don't need to supply housing for other cities like Mountain, Mountain View. Mountain View is the apartment capital of the world. Let them go over there, okay? It doesn't fit there. And we know what it's all about. It's PD. No, you're not guaranteed anything. The, the, uh, you know what the plan says? It says keep it commercial. Yeah, that's your problem. You're, you're turning uh, retail into uh, housing, which is ridiculous. Summerhill, come on. After 90 North, they're on my you know, list. They are bad people, okay? You guys are raping our retail. Oh, it's ridiculous. Um, Mr. Mr. Yeah, they, no, you're, please, you're, you're taking our keep retail. It. Okay, you're taking no a retail. No personal tax. You're, you're taking Thank a retail. You. These guys are bad people. No. They are bad people, okay? And you know what? And you know Hazel, it. It's just for Mr. Profit. Hazel. It's just building please, a, Mr. A Hazel. Owner, making them the t total maximum profit. Just make a profit. Forget the people. You're screwing us. And everybody knows that you've been doing a long all El Camille. You took all our light industrial out of Thank you, Mr. Oh, Hazel. Stop. Thank you. Stop. Thank you. Welcome. Sam Hagak here. It's good to be back. Um, after that, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> I will say that I agree with Raj, um, the previous two speakers ago, um, that seeing how this uh, uh, project has transformed into what the proposal is today is a breath of fresh air. I think it is miles ahead of what it was originally. Um, all the amenities and kind of the way that they are approaching the comprehensive um, uh, proposal, you know, a look at the comprehensive proposal, I think is fantastic. Um, and I think they are to be commended for that, and I think they're to be commended for doing some of the community outreach that we have been asking them to do. But like my comments that I brought up in the first time that this was proposed, that is a commercial zone. Um, we are doing right now 
a, an area specific plan for El Camino and this is coming in before that is complete. Using PD plan development for one-off projects, I've always been opposed to that when they are small projects littered throughout the city. There were some comments about the um, uh, facts that were presented in Don Whedon's presentation, which are absolutely critical and absolutely legitimate. He also mentioned in his proposal that it is not appropriate to be doing haphazard placemaking, you know, scattered throughout the city. I look at plan development as opportunities for us to take large areas of, um, of the city and look at them comprehensively and how they can work entirely together. We talk about placemaking, that those two shaded tables that they put on the corner street is not placemaking. I know it's a hot buzzword that we like to use, but trying to claim placemaking because of two covered round tables that probably seat four or five people is not placemaking. So I think it's a great proposal. I agree with Raj. It's not in the right place. That is a Santa Clara Town Square. That is a commercial development. It is taking the um, square footage out of um, viable established commercial businesses and it is not replacing it with something equal or better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Welcome. My name is Diane Changris. I live on Walk Drive. I've lived there since 1960. And I, have an, I don't have an objection to this project. When they built the Target Shopping Center, they were very respectful to us in the trucks that went by, or the, and it hasn't increased the traffic. This is a beautiful project. The company who owns the piece of land, if they don't do it, they're gonna sell it to someone else. And what are you gonna get? This is, is gonna help seniors, it's gonna help the community. It's a beautiful project. I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chengris. Anyone else? Please come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, City Council. Um, full disclosure, I did speak to Joe Head and I did speak to Summerhill. Uh, I also spoke to the owner of Myuri and I tried to look up some of the other previous owners there as well, but I wasn't as successful and I didn't have enough time to do a lot of things. Um, to be honest, this is one of the better projects I've seen along the El Camino. The reason that's unfortunate is you approved all the other ones. <laughs> I think that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, what I usually say is um, the bad projects that were approved have stolen all the resources for the new projects or the better projects that came after that. In this case, though, I'll tell you what I do like. I do like the greater than eight foot sidewalks. We had some uh, walking tours along the El Camino. And I'll tell you, as a new father with a baby that's in a stroller, people say, is she walking yet? She's not just walking, she's taking my car keys. <sighs> right, and so when people say there's no future drivers, there are future drivers. Hope she's not one of them. But anyway, there's a lot of things to like about this project, and I think it's very good. But at the same time, um, when you have a traffic study by, again, Gary Black from Hexagon, same people who did like 50 other projects along El Camino and uh, 900 Kiley, telling you that the traffic is gonna decrease when we've doubled, in fact, tripled the amount of retail and the, uh, the restaurants that are there, and added an additional 155 units with 200, you know, 186 additional parking spaces, I, I don't know how to, how, to, how to counter that, right? And I think that at some point, we ought to say, look, we need some other people also to do traffic studies so that we can vet what's, what we're getting from one vendor all the time. The other thing I will say is that creating, planning is about vision. And I'll say once again, the city of Santa Clara is not going to solve the housing needs of the Bay Area. And we need to decide what kind of city we want to live in and plan accordingly. I don't like PD either. Zone it, have people, have projects that match the zoning and approve those. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, but, Kevin. But show some planning and vision, not just Thank approval. You. Thank you. Good evening. Hi there. I, I think there's some things that the people don't know at all. The reason this is getting zoned PD is because the city of Santa Clara didn't do their homework. They blew it. They have to go for PD because Santa Clara does not have the zoning that matches their own general plan. 
the developer has done absolutely everything according to the general plan. This is like making a full price offer on a house. They came in, handed you a contract, made a full price offer. They did everything they, they have done and offered to do everything they're supposed to do. The city is the one that hasn't done their part. There is no zoning to match the general plan. That's the only reason they're here. Otherwise, they would have gone to architectural review. They would have gone to CEQA. They would have never gone to the planning commission and they would have never been here. That's a wake up call to how broken our process is. But I came, when we originally did this plan, I objected to it strongly. And now I support it just as strongly. They have listened to the community. If now we want, they've never said this is affordable senior housing. And the people who come up here and preach that aren't listening. And now to put another requirement of affordable housing on them that's not required, or to want double dips for a school district that's squandering money on other projects and overpaying admins. It's not their responsibility to support the school district either. They have met every single requirement. They have even put in a dog wash for crying out loud. I mean, maybe they should have a tattoo parlor as one of the retailers. We Thank have you, a Deborah. free society. That person Thank can you. sell that property to whatever they want to do. Let them have their project, Thank please. You, They've done everything you've asked. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward, whoever would like to speak. Good evening. I've been in here. Oh. So I'm Deborah Cost. I'm here on behalf of my husband who required me to come here this evening because he couldn't. Did you say he hired you or required you? Required oh. me to come here. <laughs> so you already have his letter in the packet, and as you know, he's in support of the project. So I'm not going to read his letter because I don't have it in front of me. However, I am also in front of the pro in favor of the project. We, my husband, is a lifelong resident. He's been here for. Over, well over 60 years, and I have been in the city for about 50 years. So we both have been in the city for a very long time. I think it's a perfect location for the project because it has all of the amenities. I know um, some of my previous commissioners, or I, I used to be on the planning commission, don't agree with me, but I do believe this is a perfect location. The thing with seniors is you want to be able to not have to get into your car. You're not going to go out during commute times. You want to be able to go to the grocery store. You want to be able to go out for dinner. You want to go get your nails done. You want to be able to have meetings and have the amenities. And this project affords all of those items. Uh, parking, you know, if you're a senior and you're married, you probably are going to downsize to one car versus two because most of the time you're going to go places together. You're not utilizing vehicles the way you used to. And I agree with the traffic study. It probably will not impact and it'll probably make it a little bit less because you'll have people that will be living there, shopping right on site or within that small community right there. And I agree with Diane Changers. If this project doesn't go in, the owners of the property are going to sell it to somebody else who's not going to have a project that will be as desirable for our city. And I also agree we could probably put, throw on an extra um, story. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Second. Second. Close the public hearing. Oh. Oh, okay. We'll hold that. Uh, developer, would you like to come forward and answer some of the questions? Thank you. Welcome back, Elaine. Thank you. Um, well, first, I'll, I'll mention parking. Um, the uh, we looked at parking very closely because it was a community concern as well. Um, so we we actually talked to operators um, and had our own uh, market lo looking at the market. Um, and we, I would say, rounded up to the 1.26 spaces per unit. 
Um, the 100 North Winchester project, which is a 55 plus project that was approved here in Santa Clara is at 1.14. So we, we are, we do have more parking um, than they do, but um, I just at least want to share that information with you. Uh, we, as we mentioned, we are generating uh, over $300,000 to the school district every year, and there are no children on, on the project. Um, this was a new piece of information, uh, but we would be willing to double the statutory fees um, uh, that was requested tonight. Um, with regard to the businesses, um, so as we mentioned, there's two that are coming back in. Um, and uh, we're very excited about that. Um, but there's also gonna be room for six more. So we realize we're, we're making the space smaller, but it's designed to accommodate more businesses, and I think that's really important. Um, and uh, I would like to bring up our um, outside counsel, um, Jeff Otterman, to address the legal aspect of the senior housing questions. I, okay. I was gonna ask that if, yeah. That, yeah, if that could be addressed, please. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Jeff Otterman. I'm a partner with the law firm of Rutan and Tucker. I've worked on a lot of, of senior housing projects. So, um, I wrote a, a shorter me version of a longer memo I vetted through your city attorney's office. My, the shorter version is, I think, the last couple of pages of your this item in your agenda packet. But briefly, how do you guarantee that this will remain senior housing? It's, your, it's baked into your zoning ordinance. Conditions C23 through C25 require that. And just as- Go ahead, continue. Me, we need to- Every other answer. property on the zoning map up there, the thousands of properties you have in this city are required to comply with the zoning regulations that apply to those properties. Ours will too. And those regulations uh, remain in effect in perpetuity. Um, there are federal laws and there are state laws that govern discrimination in housing. Age discrimination is one form of discrimination in housing. And the exception that allows uh, for senior housing is very tightly defined. And it, in federal law, it's the Federal Fair Housing Act uh, amendments um, of 1968. State law is even more restrictive. It's called the Unruh Civil Rights Act. And there's a very detailed list of the permitted occupants. And contrary to what uh, one of the speakers said previously, 100%, not 80%, but 100% of the occupants have to be, the primary occupant has to be a, a senior. And there, then there's a very limited list of, of other permitted occupants that can uh, occupy that same unit they derive that status from the primary um, eligible status of the senior. It can be a spouse, um, a cohabitant, a caretaker, or someone who is, uh, doesn't meet the age requirement but is uh, disab a disabled person who's being cared for by the senior. That's it. And when you walk through senior projects, you don't see kids running around. Uh, unless they're visiting, you know, their grandmother or grandfather for for the day, um, you don't see uh, twenty five year olds or forty year olds uh, because they're not permitted to live there. And if they do, everybody from the attorney general of the United States down to the district attorney, down to the city attorney, the California attorney general, there's you know there are about twenty different enforcement agencies that can enforce those and do if they need to enforce those restrictions. So this is one of the most heavily regulated <clears throat> and controlled type of uh, housing environments there can possibly be. So there, there won't be any violations and uh, the residents themselves can, can, will police that. They choose to live there because they, they've, they're living in a senior environment. So uh, they're not gonna be happy if uh, kids start moving in. That's thank all. thank I, you, that was helpful. Thank you. And good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Katya Kamangar with Summerhill. I just wanted to come up and um, provide a little bit of a conclusion as well um, to Elaine's presentation. It was very comprehensive, but I did want to uh, just say, state that um, you gave us very clear direction back in March. There are certain things you were looking for and we believe we have delivered on those. Um, but at the same time, they do come at a cost and you know, removing the fifth floor eliminated significant amount of leasable square footage for us. 
converting to senior housing, um, also reduce this, the rents as, as uh, much as 10%. Um, so these are all costs added to the bottom line, but we're excited about delivering a senior housing proposal at this location. Uh, we think it's, it's a need that serves the community. And um, senior housing is, is more difficult to bring together and pull it together. And that's why we're not seeing it, even though the market is very good, it's more difficult to finance. And so we want to be able to deliver this housing to you. We do understand there's a need for affordable housing in the city of Santa Clara and the ask has been made. And as Elaine mentioned, we're, we're offering the five uh, moderate um, affordable units. Um, but at the same time, uh, we are not looking for a similar outcome as, as back in March. So if in your deliberations you find that uh, the only way to pull the votes together is uh, to uh, make us like all the other projects, even though we are senior housing and, and I would say arguably different in that way and different and distinguished, um, then we would, um, you know, reluctantly accept that, I guess I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Second. And that passes unanimously. Councilmember Mahan, your light's on first. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to clarify one thing before the speaker, I should have jumped in. The offer, I believe, was made to increase the school district contribution from 300000 to 600000 That's No, I don't think that's it. No. No, no the, the 300000 happens annually. The that's increase it. would be double the fees, which is $110,000, uh, would be doubled. So the one hundred and ten would be doubled to two twenty. That's correct. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so I would like to, and I asked the city attorney if we take these two um, recommendations separately for votes. You mean approval of the uh, mitigated negative declaration? Yeah, I would do do them separately. Thank you. So I would make the, then the first motion to adopt the mitigated negative declaration and adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the 2232-2240 El Camino Real residential project. Um, Thank you. You know, I do believe that this is a needed project in Santa Clara. Yes, it's never been touted as low income or even moderate income housing for seniors. It's a market rate housing for seniors meant for mature folks that may be retired, uh, may be looking to downsize, may be looking to sell their home, and they will be able to afford market rents. Uh, I, I look at my mom, she's lived in a house for 60 years. She stays there because she can afford it, because she's owned it for more than 60 years. The property taxes are low, she pays less than $1,000 a year in property taxes. But if you take 151 seniors who are willing to sell their houses because they want to stay in Santa Clara, and they want to adopt this kind of lifestyle where the amenities are readily available to them, where they have people that they can congregate with and become friends with, where they could walk to shopping, where they have a lot of amenities, including a place to walk their little dogs, because they all have them. It would be a, a boon for all of those 151 seniors who are, who are looking to do just that. And of course, when someone like my mother sells the house that she paid $20,000 for, for you know, one point whatever million, those property tax increases benefit our city, benefit school districts, um, and you multiply that by 151 people, Every year, that's a big increase in property taxes that we can foresee. So it has that kind of ripple effect of larger benefit to our whole community. The retail space, I think, is adequate. Retail, retailing is changing. The landscape for retail is, is changing. And the need for huge retail spaces, unless you're a Costco or a Target, is really diminishing, and most retailers are probably looking for smaller spaces. They don't need large inventory space. I mean, the supply chain, it makes it really easy to get your what you need to sell, and you don't have to keep a large inventory on, on hand. So the smaller spaces, I think, will actually be more efficient and attract more retailers. Um, so I'm hoping that we can pass this project. I think it, it fills a niche in housing that we really need. And I think it's location next to Santa Clara Town Center, I guess. I can't remember if it's Town Square, Town Center, they're all over the place. Uh, but it'll be a nice compliment to that. Uh, so I'm hoping that we would approve this one and then go on to the next motion to adopt that as well. 
Councilmember Davis. Um, I, Vice Mayor, um, you seconded that motion. Are we taking these individually, or do you yes. want comments? Okay. Um, so my comments are along similar lines. This is supplying a much needed niche. And the other thing was, is that they have worked diligently with the retailers that are there to keep them. We don't want to lose any more retail. Uh, the other thing about the community room, they offered that to us. And uh, we just had a youth commission meeting and they needed kind of a place to hang out. So that's a, a plus for us. But the other option that we have is we could turn that into retail. But I think the need right now is for the community room. Um, I disagree with some of the people that said this was a bad location. I think this is an excellent location for seniors. It's walkable. They have restaurants. They have the much needed pharmacy, the grocery store. I mean, all of these things that they have, it's just right there. And I agree with some of the other people here that their parents can afford to age in the city and not have to move somewhere else. And I think that that is a major plus for what we have. It's not going, this is not the end all to be all for all of our issues, but it certainly is a great start. And I think it's probably the best project on El Camino. Did you say that, Adam? Somebody, somebody said this was probably one of the better projects, or maybe that was Kevin Park. But looking at it, they have come a long way. It was going to be something that we totally disapproved, and I did disapprove the first one, but this one, fulfills every need that we have asked them. They have given it to us, and I think that the there was a little hit piece that went out, and I'm really sorry about that, because that was fake news. We don't like fake news, we want facts. So I wholeheartedly support this project. So I guess we're gonna approve the first, most, the first recommendation, correct? Councilmember O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of concerns about this, and, and I, I really do think that we do need to look at the changing needs of seniors in our community, and as well as young people. That's one of the largest growing demographics, and you know, I, I look at the age of a lot of the folks on my street, and, um, and you know, and I think, as Patty mentions with her mother, that some of the some of the ladies on my street would maybe want to move to some place like this if they had a place that they could go to. Rather, they're all living in three and four bedroom homes with three bathrooms by themselves. And it, it does get harder to maintain it. And when they sell those homes and um, not, you know, obviously not everybody in Santa Clara has a lot of money, but there's a fair number of our, you know, seniors have, who have been very judicious with their funds and, you know, just selling those homes or leasing those homes will provide them a really good monthly income. And, and, and so we, we will still have to take on the challenge of finding places to build um, housing for those seniors who would not be able to afford this. You know, we have that problem whether somebody is 35 or 75. You know, so just as we need to find affordable housing for the younger people, we continue to need to find affordable housing for our seniors who definitely deserve more places like Liberty Towers to be able to um, move to and to have community. And you know, as they, that that comment that was made about loneliness. I mean, I'm I'm hearing more and more about that, and reading that about, you know, isolation for whatever age, but particularly if you're a senior, that can be like practically your death now. Um, and I um, I want to um, agree with what Miss Bress had to say about the zoning ordinance. Um, our zoning ordinance has probably been out of date for 25 years. Um, it was, you know, like a, a bane of my existence when I was on the planning commission, and that has been the genesis of many of our PD, and I have spoken out against those, those planned developments. Uh, when we were, I was, I think I'm the only one here that was on the general plan steering committee. We recognized then that there were issues with the zoning ordinance, and then actually the planning commission spent hours trying to go and make little one-by-one -one adjustments of certain pieces of property, which is not the way to handle it. And um, so finally, and, you know, the community development director has um, uh, led a contract and we did, the council did approve a contract. We are bringing a um, consultant on. I know that uh, Scott Lane wishes we had more, you know, was using more internal resources, but because, we, you know, the, to get things done uh, more expeditiously and with a level of expertise for specific projects. So we will have our zoning ordinance up to date. 
And, you know, I had talked about and we, uh, I had advocated that we not approve any more projects on El Camino that didn't comply with the general plan. And then that's when we kind of went and looked at some of the projects that were already in the pipeline, and this was one of them. And it does comply with the general plan. And actually, I believe what they did the last time complied with the general plan. But I want the community to know that we are still in the process of working on that El Camino specific plan. And that will be the time to really look at a lot of these things of what we want the El Camino to, to be. And I think, you know, some of us have great hopes that if, say, if the Moonlight Center gets redeveloped, that we can find a way to create vibrant retail. We, you know, I mean, if you just hear the news, look on the internet, read your newspaper, for those, the small shrinking portion of the population that I'm one of that gets a hard copy of the newspaper, more and more stores are closing all the time. So we've got to find a way to create retail environments that will be successful. And some of that is having um, a lot of patrons nearby. And one of the letters of support we got was from the Holder family that owns the Mission City Grill. And they're looking forward to having more customers. You know, and that, I think that that would be a, a, a restaurant that would get a lot of patronage. I also want to assure the members of the community that we do, that the council and staff does look out for our businesses. And one of the letters of support that we got today was from Mr. Sam Kumar, who owns Mayuri Restaurant. And I believe that he has come to an agreement. I believe that the representatives of Summerhill said that. So I commend them for really working with uh, Mr. Kumar, who we know has been a really strong member of our community. So, and you know, he's a strong advocate amongst the small businesses, and we want that to be a sign to other small businesses that the, the city is going to look out for their best interests because what's in their best interest is in the best interest of all of us. And that'll be a signal to any other developers that you know we want to see our small businesses accommodated and strengthened. Um, so for all of those reasons, I will be in support of um, adopting the mitigated neg deck and for approving the um, the change is zoning. Uh, Vice Mayor Caserta. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I thought this project tonight was a watershed moment for this council in the sense that um, we asked the applicant to do some changes and predictability is important. And this city has always been known as a city of what's possible. And it's always been seen as a strong business friendly city. I mean, I want to be crystal clear to the community. I think Summerhill checked every single box from community engagement to creating a shared experience, active retail, rolling up their sleeves and trying to keep as many of these existing businesses there. They're keeping half of them there. I really appreciated the comments from the school district. They stepped up to the plate there. Um, so I thought just from a predictability standpoint and from a queuing standpoint, of the business community. I think this was important for us. But more personal, I always used to say that the most popular person in Santa Clara is Patty's mother. And my Aunt Dorothy used to love when I said she was the second most popular person. Mm -hmm. And we lost Aunt Dorothy a few years ago. In her last about 18 months, she really was lonely. Um, I had just gotten married. My mother moved out of the area. And she really, really would have liked a shared experience like something like this. Like Teresa said, she bought her house for, I think, $17,000, had a pension, had a bunch of equity, was a widow, and she just wanted to be around people. And this development provides that. And what I love about it most of all is you could literally walk to the senior center if you're active. You can literally walk to holders and get breakfast. And what I really liked about this was our, our council uniformly talked about a community room, and this is going to be unencumbered for any Santa Clara to create another shared experience. And I just want to say to Summerhill, um, you know, you are truly a community of distinction because right down the road, you have a project that is sensitive to the existing neighborhood that is just a top of the line project. I know a lot of my colleagues have visited it and you have done everything we asked of you. And I am proud and enthusiastically going to support this project. Well done. Councilmember Watsonabe. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I think this is a great project. I, I really do. I appreciate how Summerhill has listened uh, to the council and reached out to the community. Um, 
I've listened to everybody that's spoken tonight. Um, Mr. Shore brought up an article in the Mercury News that appeared in this weekend's paper. I read that same article, and, and that really hit me hard when I read 4,700 people lost their jobs or moved out of the area because they can't afford to live here. And so with that loss, I mean, we lose too because a lot of those are people that work in restaurants and, and hotels and the people that we rely on to be there to, to be able to serve us. And But there are also people that wanted to be here and, and have a good job and and um, but now have been forced out because of... Um, because of rent increases and not being able to afford to live here. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why I was really happy to hear you bring up um, the five moderate income units because I know a lot of those people are probably senior citizens and uh, they can't afford to live here anymore. And a lot of them, you see a lot of them, they work in places like Target and even the stadium. You know, they have second income jobs are, are to supplement and uh, their incomes. And so um, I, I think it's really important that we do have some kind of uh, affordable housing. And, and, I, and I understand that um, uh, Summer Hill has, you know, taken off one level of housing uh, of apartments. Um, to comply with the you know requests, and they've heard what the community has shared, um, uh, and but in, in as much as um, I appreciate the five moderate income units, and just uh, knowing how the area has been impacted by housing increases, um, I'm going to ask if you would consider that five moderate to be five low income. House, uh, units uh, instead and uh, that is going to be my request if, if you would consider that um, and uh, I know I would probably make a lot of uh, a lot of seniors uh, very happy that in the form of a friendly motion I'm, is, I'm not sure we should be asking the developer at this point to not, not for this Please. Not for the Not next for this one. Oh, this, this okay. Well, let's go for the next um, the for the next uh, approval, which is the rezoning. Okay, great. Okay, okay I'm All happy right. we'll to hold, hold it off until the next then. One. Thank you. I apologize. That's okay, Councilmember Colston. Thanks, Mayor. I'm not going to uh, repeat everything my colleagues said. I agree with all of it. I agreed with this project, the first version of it, and it got better with the second version. But one thing. Um, I noticed, and uh, I'm sure the whole council did, uh, we got this, uh, somebody passed this piece of propaganda, political propaganda down here for me to look at. And uh, I think we know a little bit about political hit pieces and political propaganda. And this is, um, there's uh, pretty much everything in it is misinformation. Um, uh, actually, a lot of it's just blatant lies. And somebody sent it out to, some neighbors, I guess, around this development, this proposed development. And uh, if I hadn't had my mind made up before I saw this, this would have definitely uh, encouraged me to vote to approve this project right off the bat. This is really a, a despicable hit piece. There, there's outright lies in here. But the other thing I noticed, there's no attribution. Whoever sent this out didn't have the the guts to put this is sent by Joe Smith or the political action committee or something like that. It's an anonymous hit piece. Yeah, it does. It has a seal on it. You're right. Uh, you know, people, if you see this kind of stuff come in your mailbox or at your front door, try to do some research um, and see if anything in here is true because this is, this is really a lousy piece, and uh, none of it's true. So I'm going to be joining you all to support this for sure. Thank you. Many people don't know what we're talking about, so oh, yeah. let's not even read it and discuss okay. it, okay? Um, some people received that at their doorstep. Others didn't, so. Teresa. Um, anyways, okay. Anything else, Councilmember Colstead? 
Okay, so there is a motion uh, and a second on the floor for the first, which is adopt the mitigated negative declaration and adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the property. And that passes unanimously. Okay, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. So if I can go to the next one. Yes, please. So I would move to approve the rezoning from community commercial to plan development to allow a four-story mixed-use development with 17,909 square feet of commercial floor area and 151 senior apartment units, including the additional, additional conditions of approval as recommended by the Planning Commission and as agreed by the applicant. Um, I appreciate Council Members Watanabe's desire to go from moderate to low income. However, I'm concerned that such a major change at this late date would significantly change the economics of of the whole development uh, because it, it makes a considerable difference in, in rents and, and oversight because you would have to make sure that the, the applicants continue to uh, qualify. Um, it, it's just a whole different category of, of housing to say that they're low income units. It has a very spe specific sort of legal ramifications. Um, and at this late date, I think it's just a little bit too much to, to put on the developer. Um, so I'm just going to go with the conditions as they are with the moderate uh, units. Because uh, so, that, that alone will give substantial rent reduction to, to five lucky seniors. There's motion and second. Councilmember Watanabe, you have your friendly amendment. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I would like to um, make uh, continue with my, my friendly uh, amendment um, and ask if uh, Summerhill would consider um, such an amendment. All right, is there a second to the friendly amendment for the, the five units that were offered to be um, uh, low income? Yeah, low income. Low income yes, level. Mayor. Yes. Could we get some, some clarification on what that means? Because, it, like I say, it, there's, there's a lot to it. You can't just say low well, income. Well, um, first From of all. From our city attorney, well, it's, actually. It's, it's, it's either Wait a second. Or... Everybody's talking at once. So Councilmember Watanabe has a friendly amendment. Councilmember Mahan asked for a clarification on what low income uh, level is. There's different levels. So and what are the legal like requirements to... and what's the legal oversight to make sure that someone Qualifies as a low-income tenant. Well, that's and what that's, moderate means as well. So, who can answer that question for Councilmember Mahan? Come forward, please. Either she or I. I think it's pretty self-evident, but please come forward and. Lower-income households are those earning 80 percent or less of area-wide median income, adjusted for household size. Affordable rent is 30% of uh, adjusted gross income with a, a lot of adjustments. The normal rule is that uh, for lower income households, the rent has to be uh, affordable to a, a household earning 60%. Um, moderate income, on the other hand, is 120% of area wide median income, and affordable rent is generally. Uh, rent that's affordable to a household earning 110% of area-wide median income adjusted for household size. So the difference from going from moderate to low or lower is almost having the rent. It's a very, very dramatic impact on the rent. Okay. Um, so uh, there's been a request for a friendly amendment. As the second of the, the motion, I, I will not be accepting that. Um, Won't accept that? Nope. And the maker of the motion? No, I really want to, I, I think, as I say, it's, it's, it's probably, it just seems like it's overly, they, they've done so much and they've come so far and they've reduced the, the size of the units, they've reduced the size of the project. I just don't see how we can impose this additional burden on them. And the reason why I'm not accepting a friendly amendment is, as I just talked about a moment ago, predictability. They've done everything for us. Councilmember Watanabe identified the fifth floor being cut off. They'd be willing to do that if we went fifth or sixth floor. We said no to that. And we all remember the Visaville site. People in this neighborhood said, if this project isn't here, what's next? All right, we, we, we did this before, which was not good public policy. 
and we have those turquoise units still there, okay, when we could have had a great project by Irvine, and I'm not going to let this happen here, that the friendly amendment I will not be accepting. Uh, Council Member Colstad and then Watsonabe. Well, I was going to make the comment that yeah. Council Member Caserta did. We lost a beautiful project a year or so ago because at the 11th hour, someone came up with uh, the idea to ask for more affordability and uh, the developer walked. And I, I won't su support that uh, amendment. Councilmember Watanabe. Uh, is there a second? <laughs> okay, well then. Second it if I could. <laughs> vote on this motion and if it fails, we can make another motion. Well, I, I don't want to see the project lost. Um, I, I think um, obviously affordable housing is a very important component in any project that we've talked about going forward and uh, I w am happy to withdraw the, the motion but uh, at the same time uh, I hope people will not forget that we the need for affordable housing especially for seniors. Thank you. Thank you um, Councilmember Watanabe. I would have supported it because I don't think I don't think it's any dramatic change since the five units were just added this evening for affordable housing. So that was also brand new information uh, to us and they're at moderate rates and that's fine. Uh, we've had a policy of uh, requiring or asking for voluntary because we, have, we don't have our, our affordable housing fees and requirements in place yet. But if they were in place because they're in process, we would have had 15% of this project uh, affordable housing. So that was our lost opportunity there. We've had a, a voluntary process where we've uh, required other projects to have 10% affordable housing, which I think would have been appropriate on this particular project, especially for our seniors. I mean, we all talk about housing. You know, they talked about the, the studios are 2,500. They're not talking about the prices of the one bedrooms or the two bedrooms, they're in the $3,000 range. So again, it's, it's a market rate senior housing project. I mean, and that's, that's nice, that's okay, but we've lost another opportunity to get at least 15 units uh, that were affordable. And I think that's a big part of our, our problems today is we don't have enough affordable housing and I think it would have been a small amount, especially when the representative for Summerhill got up and said to us, if it's going to be an issue of affordability, we'd be open to adding more units. But unfortunately, uh, the, the maker of the motion and the second refused the, the amendment. Um, I'm going to support the project because I don't want to see it it go. I was in favor of originally all retail and I still would like to, would have preferred all retail on this property. I understand it's been made better uh, by the, the senior component. Um, I just want us to be a little realistic on the age of the, of the seniors. I, I would qualify to live there and I have a 14 year old. So um, people are still, you know, viable at those ages and still driving cars and still doing a lot of things. But I mean, I, I think it's a great location because it's, it's near, near the, re, the retail. And I see that Summerhill has made a lot of concessions in terms of, you know, their original project, which, which didn't pass. So, um, they, they, they put forward a lot of effort to make sure that this project was gonna be a lot more viable than the original project was. I think that, I know retail has changed, but for anyone that's gone to the uh, town center, that place is booming all the time. The parking is, is just jammed. There are people there. It's so popular that if it could be replicated on this property with, with the, the types of retail, um, you know, it, it just will fit in well. This is an example of a, of a popular, successful retail center. I think there may have been some lost opportunities with, with the Target Center to add some residential there when it was built, um, but maybe sometime in the future. Um, it, this, this isn't my ideal project. I certainly would like more retail. I'm glad they, uh, Summerhill came to terms with with at least one of the existing tenants, hopefully more than one, two. I heard the, the phone store too. Um, I think it's important, it's, it's, even if that space could even be bigger because it is a, uh, an opportunity for um, our community to meet in, in the restaurant there. 
Uh, I would like to see that the one space uh, maintained as a, a community meeting space. I know it will be programmed by Summerhill. I think if we can, if you can work with our city to make sure that that, that space is is uh, viable for our community. When we did, um, you know, there there's a lot of options for that, such as a um, uh, a satellite library, uh, a study center. Um, as long as there's you know coffee and food and beverage around, it could be used for so many different types of activities. I see our community filling up that space. I think it's more viable as a community space as opposed to just another retail space in the center. Uh, I think we're, we would like to take you up on that offer to use that space for the co community room. Um, other than that, I'll be supporting the project. I am disappointed on the on affordable housing, but I will support the project. So, lights oh, on the motion. Oh, and Ma Madam Mayor, sorry. Just to clarify, I wanted to include because I don't think it was part of the additional uh, original conditions of approval that the school fee will be doubled to two twenty. Just for the record. Lights on the motion, and that passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you. If we could take a five minute break, please.
Okay, if we can call the meeting back to order, please. Now we have uh, reports for action, approval of transfers to close fiscal year 2016-17, operating budget surplus, uh, $402,549 to the building inspection reserve, $5.4 million to special liability fund reserve, $6 million to working capital reserve, $7 million to capital projects reserve, and $7 million to pension trust fund, $3.5 million to pension trust fund, $34 million to electric rate stabilization fund, and approval of appropriation of $1.9 million to special liability fund for ongoing legal services. Angie, Hi. welcome. Good evening. Um, they said the best for last, right? Yeah. Yeah. This money, is good money, news. Money. So I wanted to kind of uh, walk you through the uh, surplus. So we have the 2016-17 when we closed the year, the general fund operating budget surplus. We had a beginning surplus of $25.8 million. And as you mentioned, we are um, say, uh, recommending building inspection reserves of um, for about $400,000 that um, that is legally restricted and needs to go into uh, the building inspection reserve. And then we also have $5.4 million to go into the special liability fund reserve. These are one-time monies. I, I just wanted to clarify that too. Um, you know, we had a, um, some uh, higher revenues due to the sale of some land from the successor agency. And um, also we had lower expenditures than we had budgeted and this was due to efficiencies and vacancy savings. So we ended um, with $20, $20 million to allocate. And just wanted to, and this is a slide just to show you the amount that went into the building inspection reserve and the special liability fund. I did want to call out the $1.9 million that we will be asking to appropriate for ongoing legal services. So the way we are recommending to allocate the general fund uh, budget surplus is we are recommending $6 million go into our working capital reserve, and this is our 25% of appropriations. Uh, this will allow us to make the 25% plus give us a little bit more to kind of save up for the on, um, deficits that we see going forward. Uh, we are recommending $7 million in the capital project reserve and um, $7 million into the pension trust fund. And the capital project reserves the $7 million. Um, this will allow us to, you know, as I think you all remember when I did the budget report, we, sh we had about a $7 million deficit going out. So this will actually help us uh, go further out into the five years. And we um, will actually um, restore the capital projects for the $1.5 million that we just recently appropriated from the capital re uh, project reserve for the Mission Branch Library. On the pension trust reserve, as you may recall, this year we actually are in 2016-17, we actually started the trust and we put $5 million into that trust and that $5 million was from the general fund. So we are recommending $7 million um, from the general fund and then an additional $3.5 million from the electric fund. Just to give you a quick rundown on the pension trust reserve, the current unfunded accrued liability equals about $465 million. The general fund portion of that is about 75% or $346.6 million. The total general fund contribution after the $7 million is added in, into the trust will be $12 million or 4% of the general fund's UAL. Uh, electric fund portion of the um, unfunded liability is 19%. And, or that's $86.2 million. And the total electric fund contribution will be 3.5, which is also the 4%. So we tried to stay in line with both uh, funds. And then uh, as we prepare the upcoming budget, we will look at other, such as the water, sewer, and come up with a funding strategy so that all funds are actually contributing into the, um, the pension trust. For the electric rate stabiliz stabilization fund, staff is recommending transferring $34 million into this reserve. Uh, this transfer will bring the fund to a nearly $121 million, which is slightly above the 120 target level. Uh, reaching this target level will also allow staff to approach both um, the rating agencies and request a, um, a rating uh, or outlook upgrade. And the current rating, just wanted to show, is um, eight, Fitch, for Fitch is eight uh, plus with a positive outlook, and the goal is to receive a double A negative. 
and S&P is currently at eight plus with, uh, with a negative outlook. So the goal is to receive a positive outlook at a minimum. And with that, concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Davis. Um, thanks, Angie, for the report. Um, I got a chance to talk to the city manager about this today. So I would like to move staff recommendation. Can I do it in a swoop? All five, all, okay. So I'd like to make the staff recommendation uh, for one, two, three, four, five, and six to move the um, monies into the funds. Motion second. Is there any questions from the council? Any member of the public? Uh, council Member O'Neill, maybe you. before you go. <laughs> you almost left. Okay. I was just curious. Um, were there any other thoughts that you, you know, I mean, like in terms of did everybody kind of hit on these items or was these, you know, these are the ones that rose to the top, the, you know, right away or um, in terms of where to allocate the funds? It was a collaborative effort. We uh, met and city manager gave input and as well as the team and we came up with those allocations. Um, again, we wanted to stay within the range for the pension trust, keep everybody at the same working capital. Um, I mean, capital projects, we knew we were at about a $7 million uh, deficit going out and then the, the remainder was the six million. So we put that in the working capital. Okay, all right, great, thank you. I just, I wanted to add yes. that we wanted to make, uh, if possible, because there are, these are one-time funds, a heavy contribution to the pension trust because obviously that's where, if we look out in the out years, the significant costs are gonna be accumulating. And then also put um, in the working reserve, I'm, I'm still learning all the titles <laughs> of, our, of our reserve, um, but to put the dollars there because we're still in process of budget development for next year, and so we wanted to have a maximum flexibility for the council as it begins to consider priorities and investments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Uh, members of the public? If I remember correctly, this last year, we expended quite a bit of money out of our land reserve funds, and I would like to know if it was considered to replenish that reserve instead of some of these other things. I think our land reserve is close to zero, if not zero. I don't know, Angie, if you can tell us. what I'd be interested to know what those are. Um, and I hope one of the things we're doing is looking at finally bringing our accounting system so that we, the public, can look at these things without pulling our hair out trying to find things because it's not easy to find anything on our system. Um, but that's one thing. And then another question I have is we still have not seen a figure, although it said uh, unfunded liability. I don't know if the unfunded medical liabil medical insurance liability is posted yet or that should be posted. I believe it's legally required to be posted. Is that number included in that that? 465 million, or is that number still to be disclosed in this next calendar year? That's the elephant in the room nobody wants to talk about, but it is a, another chunk of money that's an unfunded liability that nobody wants to talk about. When, somebody, you're, when you're finished, just somebody I'm can writing finally, down the questions. Yeah, so. that, that's another unfunded liability that we haven't talked about. So um, I would like to see, and I guess consider this another public information request, um, a synopsis of all the reserves that we have expended in the last two years that shows what we had, what we expended, and what we have left. Because I don't know how we can find it any other way. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, city manager? There's um, the CAFR that's printed annually. I believe that um, the medical unfunded liability would be captured under the post-employment benefits, the OPEB. Maybe we can find out what that is. Yeah. We've had more than I'm looking a to few Andy to see if she inquiries knows about the, that. The OPEB. Or at least maybe in your newsletter as well. Yeah, I don't yes. recall off the top of my head what the uh, total amount was, but I do know we have a funding strategy. We're um, paying that over 22 years. So we do have a strategy in place where we're 
making those payments. Uh, we do get an actuarial from Bartell. I, I believe that um, Ms. Bruss is talking about, I think it's GASB 75 maybe, but she's talking about that we're gonna be required to actually put that on our financial statement. So that's a book entry just like we did uh, recently with the pension liability where we actually show what that liability is. Can we get that available for the sure. public? Sure. Thank you. And then I just wanted to, on the land sale, we and have- reserves, yes. What do we have left <laughs> in that? So um, we have $39.3 million in there now, and that, that reserve is strictly for when the city sells property. We don't typically put other money into that. That's, right. that's reserved just for when we sell land. So right now the balance is 39.3. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those instant numbers. And we'll get the uh, medical unfunded liability number. Thank you. Any other member of the public? Seeing none. Uh, Lights on the motion for staff recommendation, and that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Angie, and thank you for the report. Uh, now we have a written petition from Mark Trout, a request for the placement of Infowars.com bumper stickers on city police and fire vehicles. Is Mark here? Okay. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Caserta. This is the same news organization that says Sandy Hook was a farce. I uh, strongly um, make the motion to not request this. Uh, Just note and file. Demark yeah, this, note and file. That was my petition. next comment. Yeah. I don't see the person here e anyway. So uh, request to note and file. Motion second. Any discussion? That passes unanimously. Uh, reports of members and special committees. Do we have any? Councilmember O'Neill. I just wanted to report on that um, uh, report, and I always forget the name of it. It's going to be coming forward to the VTA board. We looked at it in committee last week on kind of what I call some of our quality of life issues, which has to do with litter, graffiti, um, uh, state of landscaping, um, collisions. It's kind of an interesting collection, uh, and VTA has been kind of measured some of the information on that for the last 10 or 15 years. And, um, you know, some of the things are, are, are a little startling, you know, when you look at, like, um, you know, I think we live in a very beautiful part of the world, and the amount of graffiti seems to be really be going up lately. They, um, uh, they had reported that episodes of litter had gone down and all the committee members were like challenging. We all challenged that. And I think they did that on one observation. Um, so, I mean, that, that is a very disconcerting issue about the amount of litter that we see on our roadways and just on our streets. Um, and so I'd like to make a plea, you know, to the residents of Santa Clara on these issues that um, that we try to keep our city as neat and clean and tidy and treat it with respect. We also say we love Santa Clara. And I say if you love Santa Clara, don't you know trash it. And we do have programs for adopt a spot and some of these other things to help us with maintenance. And and one of the issues that has come up with that, and part of the reason why they started looking at this is with that there were some studies that indicated in the Bay Area the region for us for Caltrans that there was like more litter and some of these other issues in Santa Clara County than the other counties. So um, I'm not quite sure why that would be the case, uh, but uh, we do have some programs where people can get involved to help us make sure that we are keeping things um, picked up and tidy. And, you know, if we can also do things like there are some city properties where there are weeds, we have you know, people point out to me that some of the business owners or properties, even on El Camino, where the weeds are not kept up and there's, you know, litter on the properties and it just brings down, I think, everybody's image and feeling about um, Santa Clara as well as the whole county. And, and some of these issues, some of it can, you know, is, is attributable to the, you know, the fact that we do have more homeless encampments in certain areas and that has led to the increase in, in uh, uh, trash and some things like that. But um, so, like I said, I just want to encourage everybody 
to um, be since those numbers are a little daunting and some of the the visual evidence that we all see if we can make an extra effort to just not toss food containers out the windows or and making sure that if you're taking a load of to the, or you know you if you're in construction that you cover your loads so that we don't have stuff blowing all over our streets so thank you thank you any other members want to make any reports Okay, seeing none, uh, city manager, executive director report. Nothing to report. Uh, reports on action taken in closed session. I know we're trailing for part of our closed session. Uh, city attorney. Yeah, yes, there's nothing to, re no reportable action on the first two items that we, that we covered. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, that leads us uh, to our adjournment, and uh, Council Member Kolstad asked to read the first adjournment. Thank you, Mayor. We have two. Uh, tonight we're going to adjourn in the memory of Louis Butch Pastorini. He was a former assistant superintendent at Santa Clara Unified School District. He was born April 5th, 1944, in San Francisco to Dante and Dorothy Pastorini. He graduated from Santa Clara U, some say with a major in football, but actually it was business, math, and a minor in physics. He received an administrative credential and his master's from San Jose State. He stayed in the Bay Area to raise his family and worked for Santa Clara University School District for 36 years. He, he worked as a math teacher, vice principal, principal, and assistant superintendent. His love of football stayed with him throughout his entire life. He had notable achievements in football. Uh, he was inducted into the Sonora High School Hall of Fame in 1964. He uh, was picked for the All Coast Associated Press High School team at 65, the All-America team most valuable player. He was inducted into the Santa Clara University Hall of Fame and uh, coached at Santa Clara U for 25 years until 1993. He was an incredible educator, a great friend, had a terrific sense of humor, but he demanded um, complete excellence from his students, and he got it. He's survived by his wife, Susan, and their children and stepchildren, Todd, Jennifer, Stephanie, Jeffrey, Mark, Tracy, and his five grandchildren, and his sisters, and his brother, Danny. And we're going to adjourn in his honor tonight. Thank you, Councilmember Kolstad. Uh, the second adjournment request is for Jack L. Wanger. For many decades, Jack has been engaged with, the, with Santa Clara County. In the 1970s, Jack was chief of staff for Dan McCorkendale after he helped in his successful run for county supervisor. He was a speechwriter for Ralph David Abernathy, the successor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Locally, he was very involved with the Chicano community and ensuring they had proper representation. Jack was a dedicated community organizer who devoted his time in our community and beyond. Jack's last two years were dedicated to making Santa Clara County a national heritage area where he was one of the lead consultants for this project, uh, working with Rod's father, um, Mr. Deardon. Jack's true passion was the environment. His work ranged from protecting Big Sur from naval testing and bombing to restoring the native wildlife and protecting the diverse ecosystem in the Klamath River watershed. And I most recently met with him, as I think many of us did, on our um, a barrack project and, and the agrihood. Uh, so I ask the council to adjourn in both their memories. Motion to adjourn. Motion second. Lights on the motion, and that passes unanimously. We're adjourning to closed session. Thank you. <laughs>